What's up, guys? I'm Keith Kelfas. I'm here with Dan Plata from Blue Sky Services. You may know him as the Home Service CFO, and he runs Blue Sky Services, and they have six different companies. And this guy runs the bookkeeping agency that does my books. I was referred to him by Michael Dalkey, if you know who he is, because I needed help in my business running the books and learning how to do profit and loss statements and balance sheets and all the stuff that was really frustrating me when I met Dan and he walked me through it and they took over my bookkeeping and I've learned about what he's doing. I had to have him here on the show and he's got 12 different topics he wants to talk about starting, growing your business and scaling your business. So stay tuned. Put on your seatbelt. You can also listen to this on the Untrapped podcast. We're going to dive deep, and Dan is going to teach you some very highly valuable stuff about growing and scaling a service business. Let's get started, bro. Let's do it. Five steps to a proper financial setup. How do you set up your business financially in five steps? And I'll let Dan take it. I'm so happy to have you here, bro. What's up? Let's do it. Every business needs to understand that we're here playing a math game, right? Whether we're landscaping, whether we're cleaning windows, whether we're scrubbing toilets on the inside of houses or janitorial or putting in epoxy floor coating, if we're in the game of business, we're playing a math game. There's no way around that, right? So if we're playing a math game, the first place to start is how do we set that up, right? We didn't get into business as a charity. All of our businesses are for-profit businesses. So we are here to make money. We want to do a lot of good. We want to help a lot of people. But at the end of the day, in order for us to do that, we need to be profitable. We need to be successful. So we are playing a math game. So setting it up is super important. So I'm going to give the five steps to make sure that we set that up correctly so we can grow our business profitably. Our family's better off. Our customers are better off. Our employees are better off. And that's what it's all about. So step one, separating personal stuff from business stuff. When a lot of guys start out, they're mashing everything together and they've got business transactions in their personal account, personal transactions in their business account. And it makes it impossible to make good decisions if you can't even tell why you're making them. How are you going to make a good decision and know how much this costs you and that costs you and what your return on this thing is if you don't even know how much you're investing in the thing in the first place? So to get that level of clarity and even be able to see where our money's going, and it sounds so simple, but a lot of us don't do it early on. But if we can just split up business and personal, all of a sudden we have this clarity in our business of money coming in and money going out. And that is the first step to actually understanding what's happening in our business and knowing where we're making money and knowing where we're losing money. So step one, separate business and personal. Step two, even in that business, from the get-go, we are two different human beings. We might as well be bipolar. We have two different tasks that are almost totally unrelated. One of those tasks is being the CEO of our business, and we're running that business, and we're making the day-to-day operating decisions. And especially when we start, we're wearing all the hats. We're the CEO, the COO, the CFO, the CIO, the whatever, and we're the technician, and we're the office manager. But we are getting paid to do a job. The other thing that we are that's totally different is we're an owner and we're an investor. We just happen to own and invest in a business that we work in. But you could go buy shares of Amazon or IBM or whatever stock you want on the open market. You can be an owner and investor in any company, right? You just happen to be an owner investor in your company. And a lot of times when we first start out, we don't segment those two roles and those two hats. One of them is putting capital to work and trying to get a return on our money. The other one is putting our labor to work and trying to get a paycheck. And if we don't split those two things apart, we don't know why we're making the decisions that we're making. And we're making investment decisions that are operating decisions and operating decisions that are investment decisions. In reality, we could hire somebody to run our company for us. We'd have to pay them a paycheck, but we should still be getting a return as an owner, as an investor. Many guys think they're making a lot of money, but they're only getting the paycheck. And so they start trying to scale the business. We'll talk about that later. They start trying to scale the business. They start hiring other people and they never paid themselves as an owner. They never set enough money aside as an owner. So they start paying somebody else to do the work and now they're just the owner. There's no money left. They didn't even have a business. Their business wasn't even generating a return. It was just generating a paycheck for them. So it's super important early on to make sure that we're both getting a paycheck as a fair wage for doing the work that we're doing and... As the business owner, even if we weren't getting that paycheck, the business is still making a profit after all of that that we can get as an owner for putting our money to work. So one place we're putting capital to work, one place we're putting labor to work, both things need to generate their own return. So that's why we got to split it up. I'm sure you hear about that all the time. The guys that are like, I'm making so much money. And then the next guy chimes in and he's like, yeah, but you're not even taking a paycheck. You're not even paying yourself, right? Like you just have a job and that's just your paycheck, but the business isn't making any money. So they go to sell it and the business isn't worth anything or they hire somebody to do the work and there's no money left. And that's why they they didn't start splitting themselves up between the CEO and the owner soon enough. So super important. Bro, 
step two, CEO versus owner. And that's tricky when you're like a solopreneur, right? Because you're wearing so many hats that even thinking about being the owner as a separate task is just kind of goofy. But it helps you as you start to scale the business to realize when you're wearing which hat and the decisions you make when you invest capital versus the decisions you make about how you're going to get a job done, two different types of decisions. Step three is when you're playing that owner role and thinking about your business as an investment, debt becomes a really important tool. Mm -hmm. When you're the operator, we're kind of like debt afraid. Generally, we want to buy buy shit in cash because we don't want to have this liability hanging over our heads. If we're just thinking about it from an investment standpoint, if I can go borrow money at 5%, and I can invest it in this business that generates 20%, that seems like a pretty damn good win-win to me, right? I'm going to keep borrowing money at 5% and reinvesting it at 20% until that situation goes away. I want to capture that return. And as an owner, that's the thought process. If I'm going to go finance a vehicle at 5% and I can go put it, use this money to grow my business with marketing and that grows at 20%, I'm just going to keep doing that transaction all day, every day. And as business owners, we kind of bring this personal financial vibe a little bit of Dave Ramsey, like debt's a bad thing and we don't want debt. And I'm all about that in my personal life. Like I have a mortgage on my house and that's it. But like I'm trying to buy vehicles with cash unless I have like an investment opportunity, like the trade-off is still the same, but I'm super debt averse as an individual. In my business, it's just a math game. If I can borrow money here and reinvest it there at a guaranteed return on one hand and a guaranteed output of interest on the other hand, I want to capture that spread and that's the value of having a business. And my business generates a return, whereas as an individual, I don't. If I go finance money to buy a personal car, that personal car doesn't generate a return for me. If I go finance a business vehicle, that business vehicle is out doing work, generating a return. And so now there's a value in financing that thing versus paying it for cash. So step number three is debt isn't evil. Credit cards are great as long as you pay them off. People are super afraid of credit cards. And they're freaking great in our businesses. Mm -hmm. For the cash flow purpose, they Mm -hmm. delay our payment 30, 40 days. Cash is king. We need that cash. Delaying payment on stuff for 30, 40 days is amazing. 0% interest every time you do that. And you get all these bonus points. That's real. That's 1% to 2% back on a whole bunch of stuff. And we're spending tens of thousands of dollars every year, if not every month. And getting some of that back is huge. So credit cards can be a huge asset to our business assuming we don't like rack up a bunch of interest bearing debt at those interest rates, they defeat themselves pretty quick if we're not responsible. But personally, maybe don't have a credit card if it's not good for you, right? It's not the right thing for everybody. But in our business, it makes a ton of sense to push the payment back that 30 to 40 days, get the points on everything we buy because we're going to buy shit. We need to buy shit to run our business. So step three, credit cards and debt are okay. We still need to be responsible about them. We don't go finance a boat. We go finance a work truck that goes and makes us money, right? Step number four, and I see this go wrong a lot, keep your accounting system separate from your operating system. Keep your jobber separate from your QuickBooks. Just like the person that you hire to do your lawn care and landscaping probably isn't the same person that you hire to clean the inside of your house and dust your knickknacks, even though that'd be great if the same person could and you just had one relationship, they're two totally different things. Just like jobber and QuickBooks are two totally different things. Yeah, it'd be great if one system could do all of that stuff for us. If it could work as an operating system and work as an accounting system, that'd be phenomenal. But just like I'm really good at financial stuff, and maybe I'm not great at cleaning stuff, and my business partner, Andy, in Minneapolis, he's great at operating the business and building processes, and I am not. And that's okay. There's very few things that are good at everything. As humans, we don't need to try to be. As systems, we don't need to try to find a magic bullet. I haven't found it. When people try to push those two systems together... A, they usually just don't understand the implications of it, but B, now they're just using systems that are built to do something else and they're using it for the wrong thing. And it's just nothing good comes of that. So I see that happen all the time. It's really easy to not connect them, just keep them separate. And that's totally fine. More of the Untrapped podcast right after this. Hey, if you're looking for what is probably the greatest software ever to run your business on, go to getjobber.com forward slash Keith. You can create proposals, invoices, collect payments, even track your entire business directly on the Jobber smartphone app. And if you want to get a totally free trial of Jobber right now, open your browser, type in getjobber.com forward slash Keith. And if after the trial, you decide you want to sign up with Keith's link, you'll automatically get 20% off your first six months. So what are you waiting for? 
Go to getjobber.com forward slash key. This is Untrapped with Keith Kalfas. Step number five of setting up your financial system from the get-go. This happens when you kind of turn the corner, I'll say around $100,000 in revenue. Could be a little less than that. Could be a little more than that. At about the point you start making $25,000 of net income in the business. Mm -hmm. So this would even be like if you're not on payroll at this point. This would even be like before you pay yourself. So this can happen pretty quick in a lot of our businesses, maybe even like the fifty to $75,000 range of revenue. We want to switch from being an LLC. I should say, first, make sure you have an LLC set up just from a liability standpoint so that you are protected from the risks that happen in your business. And if something happens at a customer's house, they can't shut your business down. You want to keep business and personal separate kind of back to step one. But when you first set up that LLC, you're generally going to be taxed as a sole proprietor which means when the business earns income, you're going to pay payroll taxes on all of the income of the business, whether you take it or not, and then you're going to pay income taxes after that. Instead of paying all of those taxes, if you set yourself up as an LLC taxed as an S-Corp, which Mm -hmm. you file Form 2553, your CPA can do it for you. You can probably do it directly. That form declares you to be taxed as an S-Corp instead of a sole proprietor. So when your tax is a sole proprietor, you're paying payroll taxes on all the income of the business. Let's say it's $50,000 of net income in the business, just because it's a round number. Round numbers are easier. If you got $50,000 of net income in the business, you're going to pay payroll taxes of 15.3% on that, which is like $7,500, $7,600. If you are taxed as an S-corp, you put yourself on payroll. So let's say now you take $25,000 as a wage. You don't take the whole 50, you take half of it as a wage. You're paying payroll taxes of 15.3% on $25,000 instead of fifty. dollars So instead of $7,600 of payroll taxes, it's $3,800-ish. Yeah, $3,800. So you save $3,800 on payroll taxes. You still have to pay all the income taxes on the $50,000, but you're only now paying payroll taxes on the $25,000 that you took as a wage, not on the other $25,000. That's if you're making $50,000 of net income. You start ramping that up towards $100,000 of net income, $200,000 of net income. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars that are left on the table if you're taxed as a sole proprietor instead of as an S-corp. And so we'll get to that later a little bit and, and specifically why to be taxed as an S-corp and how to execute it. But just to recap the financial steps here. Step one, separate business and personal so that you can get great data on your business. That's how you grow a successful business. Step two is remember that you are both a CEO and an owner and know that those are two different roles. One, you're making business operating decisions and one, you're making investing decisions. Those are different types of decisions. Step three, debt is okay. It's okay to use credit cards. It's okay to use debt. I encourage you to finance your vehicles. I'm going to talk later about how to buy assets the right way, and that's part of it is financing them. Step four, keep your accounting system separate from your operating system. That's keeping QuickBooks separate from your job or not syncing them. Last step is as you kind of get over that $100,000 of revenue or $25,000 to $50,000 of net income, make sure your tax is an S-corp. Boom. Boom. That was a lot to take in. So the number one thing that I keep thinking about as you're talking about this is once you start your own business, you start making money, you're buying tools and equipment, you're fully immersed in this thing and you want to get the hell out of that one bedroom apartment, or that was my situation. Mm -hmm. And in my case, like I always kind of go back to this. I got neighbors stealing my shoes and work boots literally off the porch, and my wife is scared to go do coin laundry because Mm -hmm. we live around a couple questionable characters. (laughs) But if you look at the business fully mathematically, like you're saying from the beginning, you got to have all this stuff in order. And I see it as a gradient, like you should evolve more and more and more into that place, keep leaning in that direction all the time. So it doesn't feel like you got to do all this right now. Mm -hmm. How does that work in your experience? And like, what's the progression of like year one, year two, year three to where somebody is fully into the place where you're talking about, or should it be that way before you do anything? Like, what do you see? It depends on your commitment. Some people get into our industry as like a side hustle. And so it just makes sense that in that case, they're just operating as a sole proprietor. They're not even set up as an LLC, right? They're basically running it as an individual, not as a business. And so in those cases, it's common that because you're not viewing it as a business, as a a thing you're going to scale as an income stream, you tend to just combine business and personal because it's kind of a hobby that pays you money. It's just a total side hustle. That oftentimes turns into a business and we don't think about that inflection point about, okay, now I'm starting to go full time and this is a real thing. And so I got to start treating it like a business. We might go get the LLC set up 
but we never set up our banking situation in a way that allows us to get that data because we're just so used to smashing them together. And so I think at the point where it stops being a hobby and starts being a career and a full-time job, that's when this gets super important. If it's just a hobby and you're not going to scale it or you're not counting on it to like make a living off of and it's just a thing you do on the side to make some beer money, then it's fine to keep it smashed together because it's not something that your livelihood is dependent on. But when it starts becoming that career and a business and something that you're passionate about and that you're trying to grow, you're only doing yourself a disservice if you keep it structured like it's a hobby still. And so when that inflection point happens, that's when you got to really get serious about keeping business stuff separate from personal stuff, even if you're the only one that owns the business and you're the only one working in the business. And so you still see everything anyway. The peace of mind and the clarity of being able to keep those two things in different spots and know what's happening where and why, that's worth every penny. Yeah, I really like the idea. And you guys have taught me because you guys do the books in both of my businesses. I have different credit cards for personal and then one for each business. So when I make a purchase on Amazon, because you can buy anything off Amazon, just mm-hmm. for example, I have the different credit cards logged into Amazon and you can choose which card you want to make that purchase with. So when the purchase is made on the back end, the bank account, the credit card statements and QuickBooks for the bookkeeper that knows that it's already in that category. Because so, why would you go out and be doing oil changes and buying tools for your business with your personal credit card? Yep. You would do with the business line of credit. So you keep it separated, but you also, like, so you're saying you have your own business, but you view yourself as like a shareholder or an employee of that business and you collect a paycheck as if you have your own W-2 like employee. Yep. Now you work for this company, you just happen to you own You just it. happen to be the number one shareholder of that company. It's great. So when you make that compartmentalization and that separation in your mind, as soon as you, like for me, the further I go along in this progression, there's so many benefits to just the mindset. Mm -hmm. It's incredible because it shows you where you're at and how much more you have to go and how much you can grow. And it's very exciting, bro. The clarity is what helps us grow our business. When people get stuck, the thing that they say is they're just overwhelmed because they don't know what is happening in their business. They usually look at their bank account. And when they talk to me the first time, they say, I'm making all this money, but I don't know where it's going, right? It's this total lack of clarity. And so when we get those bank accounts set up correctly, even if you do this right, and we'll get to the next step, there will still be points of time where you like lose clarity. And that's why bookkeeping gets so important. But even early on, just that clarity and setting up the systems the right way, so you have the right mindset. And you can tell when you're making an investment versus an expense, that's how you start actually making good money in your business. And again, this is for profit. That's why we're here. We got a lot of people to support, a lot of mouths to feed. So it's important that we make good money. Now you did cover for a second, and I don't know if you want to go more into where our number one, number two is why tax yourself as an S corp. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on that again? You did, but just recap, because some people are like LLCs, sole proprietor, S corp. Yeah. They get mushed together because they go together kind of like being a CEO and an owner. They go together But an LLC is a legal distinction. It's a limited liability company. It means that if somebody sues you because something happened at their property, they can only take the stuff in the business. They can't take your personal stuff. If you're a sole proprietor, they can take your personal stuff, right? They could take your house, they could take your car, whatever. If you are a business and set up as a limited liability company, you are now absolved of the business. It's a separate entity. And so the business is liable, but you as a person are not liable. I won't get into ask a lawyer if you want a further distinction of that. But how we get taxed is separate from that. When you first set up your LLC, you will be taxed as a sole proprietor. So that is a way that you can get taxed, which basically just means all of that income, and no matter whether you take it or not. And I think this is super important to understand. Even if you keep all the money in that business bank account and don't take a dime, you still have to pay taxes on the income that the business generated. And so if that business generates $50,000, even if you took none of it, maybe you got yourself a sugar mama or a sugar daddy and they're paying all the bills and paying for everything in the house and all the money in the business stays in the business. Even if that's the case, if your net income in the business was 50,000, you first owe payroll taxes on all of it. And then after you pay those payroll taxes, then you owe income taxes on all of it, whether you take it or not. Not to say that you should take it or shouldn't take it, but just understand how it works. Distributions don't get taxed. The net income gets taxed. So The reason to do the S-Corp thing is twofold. One is you save a shit ton on those payroll taxes. Now you put yourself on payroll and it's a tax distinction. Again, it's not a legal distinction. It's a tax distinction. 
So you put yourself on payroll. You're a W-2 employee now, like you're a legit W-2. You're taking a paycheck. You don't need to take it every week, every two weeks. You could wait until the end of the year and just take a $25,000 paycheck. So the means of how you take it, and you could take it as like an hourly employee. You could take it as a commission employee. You could take it as a salary employee. Like how you pay that is not important, not relevant. What is important and relevant is that you take a W-2 wage because now you're on payroll. You're a corporation. You're an Inc. from a tax perspective. And when you take that payroll, you're taking more as payroll than you take as distributions. If not, what it looks like to the IRS is that you're just kind of like avoiding paying taxes because they only tax you on what you take as payroll. And so if in that $50,000 example, if you took 5000 as payroll and took 45000 as distributions, it's going to look very much like you're uh, avoiding paying some taxes and the IRS's job is to have you pay some taxes. So they want to get their cut. The kind of rule of thumb, if you will, is that you should take more than 50%, also known as like a reasonable wage is what they say. But if you take more than 50% as wages, then you kind of clear that threshold. So if it's 50,000 of net income, take 26,000 as payroll. And then if you want to take that other 24,000 as distributions, then you're kind of in the clear, you're meeting that kind of 50% rule. So by doing so, that other 24,000, again, whether you distribute or not, you're going to pay income taxes on it, but you don't have to pay payroll taxes on it. And as business owners, we all have the privilege of paying the self-employment tax penalty. So we're paying payroll taxes as the employer, but also the employee. And that happens whether we're taxes as sole proprietor or taxes as an S-Corp, that doesn't matter. But we're paying 15.3% basically. And so why pay 15.3% of that extra 24000 if you don't have to? So that's reason number one. It's just like pure th- saving thousands of dollars. That's a pretty good reason. Reason number- Legally. Two, legally. That's a distinction. It's an important distinction. Reason number two is a little bit more subtle, but kind of goes back to the knowing which hat you wear. When you are on payroll, you treat your business more like a business and you're viewing the cost of the business and the cost of you doing the work as the CEO as part of the cost of running the business. So you no longer get conflicted in how the business is making its money and how you are making your money. When you're not taking a paycheck, every dollar that the business makes feels like profit. In reality, most of it is probably your wage and only a small part of it is profit. The owner gets the profit, you get the wage, right? And you're both, but the CEO gets the wage, the owner gets the profit. If you're not taking a wage, it all feels like profit. And so you'll hear guys be like, I got a 50% profit margin. It's like, well, 40% of that's really your wage. If you had to hire somebody else to do the work, most of that money's gone. The profit's like 10, 10 to 20. So when you are taxed as an S Corp, it forces you to take a paycheck. Legally, you have to take a paycheck. Now, all of a sudden, it forces you to run like a business too, because you have to take a wage. That's you paying yourself as a CEO, which now you also get very clear on how much the owner's making. And now it's a scalable business because when you can carve out what it truly makes as a business, now you have an asset. You have something you can sell. It's worth something to somebody because they know what it would cost, replacement cost to hire somebody to go do the work. And here's what the owner makes. And now it's a true investment that somebody could make and sit on a beach somewhere while the business makes money. Ah. So the subtle value of being an S Corp is you force yourself into that distinction because now you have to take a paycheck as the CEO. And if there's no money left over to the owner, you realize it real quick that, oh shit, my business doesn't actually make money. Nobody would buy this thing from me. It's not worth anything. It's just a job. And that's not a problem, but it's something to be very aware of. And as you scale it, if you are going to scale it, that owner needs to make money or you're going to have a business that you can't sell. Won't be worth anything. So doing the S Corp, like I said, has that kind of subtle second benefit to it. I love it. I love it. Now, I heard you saying, which is number three, bookkeeping is finance. Mm -hmm. Bookkeeping is finance. What do you mean by that? So I'm going to hit this with a question that I get a whole lot, which is when do I need a bookkeeper, right? Everybody kind of has to take this on at some point, but I've seen guys get their business to a million dollars and not have good bookkeeping. And I've seen people start with really good bookkeeping at $50,000 of revenue. So like, there's points in time where you can implement this thing and you'll be able to run your business without it. And I think that's the funny thing about bookkeeping is that you don't actually need to do it. As a bookkeeper, I'll be the first person to tell you you don't actually need to do it. Your taxes can get done by a CPA with bank statements and a box full of receipts. They will hate you. And when you turn around (laughs) walking out the door, they're probably going to flick you off. 
but they can complete your taxes with, I've been there. with that disaster. Right? And I didn't even know. I just thought it was normal. I'm like, okay, here's all my taxes. Here's the stuff. Here's, here's what you need. Stuff. You're welcome. And my accountant, like, it takes him way longer. And two weeks later, he's like, yeah, I was up all day Sunday for 10 hours doing all of your taxes. And we're swamped right now. And you got all this stuff going on. It's going to be an extra $800, $1,200. But I'm like, all right, well, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for dealing with it. <laughs> so I don't have to. But so that's the funny thing is bookkeeping is not for that. Now, they would love it if you do bookkeeping. I think one of the sneaky things that I see, and this isn't to dog on accountants, but they will offer to do bookkeeping for business owners, right? So your CPA oftentimes will offer to do your bookkeeping and they're not doing it for you. They're doing it for themselves because they don't want your statements and box full of receipts. Their life is way easier if they do the bookkeeping. I mean, it's going to take them some time, but it's going to take them time to deal with your mess later. They'll pitch it to you as that they're helping you, but really they're doing it for themselves to make their lives easier come tax time, but they charge you for it. So they're not adding any value to you. They're kind of adding value to themselves in a lot of cases, but they're going to bill you for it anyway because it makes their life easier come tax time. Like I'm not trying to like paint a bad picture like they're manipulating you because they're doing work for you, right? But they don't do it. Their lens isn't, let me help this business owner make money. Their lens is, let me help this business owner help me get their taxes done. That's why they do it. I believe, and we at Blue Skies believe, bookkeeping is not for that. Now, it will do that. It will make their life easier, just like they would do the bookkeeping to make their lives easier. But that's not the why. The why for doing bookkeeping is for the business owner to make better decisions, to make more money. That's why we do bookkeeping. Yes, it makes tax time easier, tenfold, 100-fold, but that's like an external benefit. It's not the reason, it's just a side benefit of doing bookkeeping. So when we do bookkeeping, it's more about finance. It's more about the decisions we make. It's not about paying our taxes. That'll get done. That's an after-the-fact thing. There's some things you need to know when you're doing bookkeeping to get it right for taxes, but most of the decisions we make in our business aren't about paying less or paying more in taxes. They're about making more money. And the side effect of making more money is we might have to pay more taxes. We still want to pay as little as legally possible, but it's an end result. The point of bookkeeping is so that you have good clarity on your data as you build a business. So you know where your money's coming, you know where it's going, and you know that you're operating it profitably. Or if you're not, you know what you need to change so that you can operate it profitably. I've ranted to you before about like how to set up a P&L. You know, we've talked about the cost of goods sold and the different buckets in a P&L. I won't get into that now, but we organize a P&L in groups of decision-making buckets. So we have things that are about productivity-related buckets. We have things that are about client acquisition cost buckets. We have administrative overhead and like your people efficiency. We have fixed overhead and your infrastructure efficiency. So there's a bunch of things that go into that, but it's not about paying taxes. It's about you being able to see where your money's going and if you're in line with your business model and if you're making good decisions. I do want to say real quick, you guys doing the books in my business and teaching me everything you taught me and going through the process has given me so much clarity and it's given me a ton of confidence. So I feel like the bill that I get from you guys, it just pays for itself because of the clarity I get gives me more certainty of that it's actually working and I can see where I need to cut the fat. So dude, I appreciate it so much. We appreciate you, man. What is it? Yourblueskies.com slash Kelfus. Yeah. You guys can say, what do they save? Half off their setup fees, 225 bucks right off the top. So if you guys, when you are ready to get your books done, could be now, could be in six months. Remember, go to Blue Skies, yourblueskies.com slash Kelfus, and you'll save half off your setup fees. That's dope. Thanks, Dan. $225 is real money. It's not like being an S Corp and saving thousands of dollars, but 225 bucks is still 225 bucks. Here's the thing. I started with this. And I didn't even answer my own question. I get the question of when should I do bookkeeping? And like I said, you don't even need to do it. But what I see and why you would do it, I mean, I kind of talked about the why. It's all about making decisions. I'm going to get into like those, the scaling decisions in a little bit here. But you start having to make those decisions where bookkeeping gets super valuable around when you hit $100,000 to $200,000 in revenue. Now, I'm not saying don't start bookkeeping sooner than that. It can still be valuable just to get that clarity. 
and know where your expenses are falling so that as you start scaling, you already know what the business model is. And you see our P&L report and it has those target percentages. Like we already know how much you should spend on each of these types of decisions. So you don't need to guess. We already know. We run the same types of businesses. We have a few hundred clients that run the same types of businesses. So we know what the successful businesses are doing. And when bookkeeping really starts to pay off is when you start having to make those decisions about investment trade-offs. When you're wearing the owner hat and you got to decide if you should invest more in marketing or more in an office person, or if you should go rent a facility, or if you should go to the huge convention and spend money on that. We know when we like go do work, we talk about cost of goods sold and how much it's going to cost us to go out and do Mrs. Jones's job. We have our cost of goods sold. We pay around 40 to 45% to go do that work, assuming we're taking a paycheck. If we're the one doing the work or we're paying somebody else, we're paying that labor, we're paying the supplies, we're paying the gas to get out there. That's a real expense now. So when we're done doing that job, we've got like 55% left after we paid ourselves if we were the one doing the work. And now we still have a bunch of decisions to make. We got to decide, are we going to like spend money on marketing, go get the next client? Are we going to hire somebody, a virtual assistant or an office person to go sell that next client or customer service that next client? Are we going to go invest in new software like Jobber? or maybe nice job or some like review type of software? Are we going to invest in a facility because we want to grow the business? That's a huge investment. We don't do it if we don't plan on growing because we need a lot of revenue to pay for that. We got to decide if we're going to invest in employees, do like employee engagement stuff or recruiting stuff. So we have all these investments that we need to decide how much we're going to spend on and if we're going to get a return on them. And so when we start having to think about those investments is when bookkeeping gets super valuable. Because if you start trying to scale your business and you don't actually know how much you're spending on each of those types of decisions, that's where I get people coming to me. And like I said, I've had this happen with people that are doing a million dollars in revenue. And I have a lot of people that are like just hitting 100,000. And the message is always the same. I haven't been doing bookkeeping or I have been, but I don't really know how to do it. Or I had my significant other doing it or my office manager doing it, but we have no idea what's going on. Either it's too far behind or it's not done correctly, or we just don't know how to do it or we haven't been doing it. And for so long, you can run your business just by looking at your bank account. And because you're the one doing all the work and you can see everything, your gut kind of tells you if it's working or not working. And the minute you start hiring other people, you start to not know anymore because there's just more expenses going out the door to pay for them, to pay for their stuff, to pay for their training, to pay for their mistakes. And then it's like, where'd all the money go? It's, It's a lot to pay attention to. And without having the actual numbers in front of you every single month or whenever you want the snapshot. Mm hmm. So you can get all this value and all this benefit by just having your books done. That's what it's all about. It's like one of the most important things when you look at it from like that perspective. The minute you're going to start making investments, if the business makes money and you're going to reinvest in the business, you sure as hell better know what it returns. Just like if you're going to go buy a stock in the stock market as an investment, you're doing it, planning on it, returning money to you, right? You're not just like, hey, Jeff Bezos, would love to invest in your company. Just have it. Love you. Go take my money. No, you're like, hey, man, I'm going to give you some money. And later on, I expect to get twice as much back. It's the same thing in our businesses. If we're going to go dump money into marketing or dump money into an office person or dump money into a facility that we rent, we're not doing it just to throw the money down the drain. We're doing it because we believe that that money is going to pay us back twofold, threefold, fourfold. And we're doing it saying like, I believe so much in myself that I'm going to put my money back into my own company instead of somebody else's right? The minute we start making those investments, we're betting on ourselves, And that's generally the right move, but we need to be looking at if it's actually paying off. And if it's not, the cool thing is if we went and invested in somebody else's company, we don't get to do shit, right? We have no say. We can't call anybody at any company we invest in and be like, let me tell you what I think we should do. They'd be like, who the hell are you? When it's our own company, we get to invest in ourselves and then we invest in ourselves and we have this money to, to play with and we get to make the decisions. That's pretty powerful. And the learning and growth and maturity and evolution, you get to evolve as a business owner. It's just awesome. Unless you don't like that stuff. To me, it just seems like it's like you're getting multiple master's degrees in the real world. It's the best way to get a degree. School of hard knocks. All right. So I want to move to number four, which is the magic formula. We had lunch before this. I ate some good food. We were talking and you started talking about capacity equals demand. That's the number. And there's a magic formula. Does this mean that the capacity that you have, I always had this idea of like ice cube, stick an ice cube tray in the sink and let water run into one of the compartments and it'll run into all 12 and fill fill them up. But when there's no more capacity, it just spills over into the sink. Mm -hmm. But if you were to have like 36 ice cube trays, it would keep filling those up. Am I off here? I like that visual. (laughs) I like that. I can picture that because every time I fill an ice cube tray, I give it a little tilt, just a little tilt and I fill the top end. 
And instead of like moving the tray, I like to just put it in the one end and just watch it go. <laughs> you sick bastard. All right. Isn't that funny? Now that I mean, Wait. like you just, you created that visual for me. It's so, <laughs> it's totally true. That's how I fill up the ice cube tray. I can't help myself. You know, those like games you get where there's the ball rolling around. It's inside a little compartment. And you got to tip the thing to get the ball to go yeah. into the feels like that. It's like a game that I get to play 30 minutes before I have a cocktail. So you tip the ice cube tray and what? I just watch the water like flow down through, right? It's like a little waterfall. Why do you do that? I don't know, because I'm a weirdo. I think that you like to watch the process. Like you created that happen. I'm just projecting. Gravity. Like, Gravity's cool. Yes. <laughs> Everybody check him out on Facebook. Your group is Bookkeeping Beer and BS. That's and you have a show and your podcast. We right? got the Bookkeeping Beer and BS podcast, and we got the Bookkeeping Beer and BS YouTube channel. My show usually goes long because it's a lot of beer and BS. It's uh, replicating business owners sitting at the bar, that conversation that we'd have. So depending on the constraints, sometimes it's an hour, but it's gone a couple hours before, just like maybe a seat at the bar might take you. But then my guy Jairus cuts it up and puts it out on YouTube in like five to 10 minute clips for those of us that don't have two hours to hang out and sit at the bar talking. Keith, I want to get to the capacity versus demand formula because it's the next step after we talk about, should we even be doing bookkeeping? The minute we start thinking about doing bookkeeping is we're making those decisions of where to invest in our business. And as we invest, the magic formula, whether you're doing 100,000 or 100 million, it does not matter. The magic formula in the home service space specifically, and I'm not saying this doesn't work in other spaces, but in the home service space specifically is capacity equals demand. You would almost think it's like a capacity plus this minus this equals demand. The formula is just as simple as capacity equals demand. And the extent to which that doesn't happen and is off, the more chaotic and stressful and shitty your life is as a business owner. So if capacity is greater than demand, that means that you have way more employees than you have customers. That's an awful life. You are stressed out because all of your employees are complaining that their paychecks are too small. You're stressed out because you have all these assets that are sitting around not producing. You probably have the vehicles and the rigs for them and there's no work to do. Because your employees' paychecks are small, they quit, right? And then all of a sudden, your capacity drops massively one day. And sometimes it drops so far that now you're short on capacity and you're long on demand. And that sounds good. It seems like if demand was great and capacity was small, we'd be making money hand over fist. But what actually happens is if demand is too great, your customers are not getting a great experience because you're rushing, because you're short-staffed, and your staff starts cutting corners, your staff starts getting stressed out because their schedule's maxed out and you're working six days a week and they're working late on Saturdays and they don't have any time for their family. Yeah, you have this great demand and you're cranking it out and you're making a lot of money, it seems like, but because your capacity is so stressed out, they quit because it's not about the money. It's about living a healthy, happy life. And all of a sudden, what was a demand problem just became a bigger demand problem because you have less employees for all the demand that you have. And you have all these customers that are pissed off at you because you told them you'd be out there in two weeks and then you have to call them back and tell them it'd be four weeks and then it's six weeks and then you just tell them you're not coming out at all. So capacity equals demand is the magic formula to grow a business that doesn't suck. Because if you grow a business and you have too much capacity and not enough demand, or too much demand and not enough capacity, the farther those things deviate from one another, the more your life sucks. And it doesn't matter which way it deviates. And the craziest thing about it is the farther it deviates, the farther it deviates. Because like I said, if you have too much demand and not enough capacity, employees quit because they're miserable because they're overworked. And then the problem gets even worse. And likewise, if you have so much capacity and not enough demand, not that you would have more capacity or that demand would drop, but that oftentimes causes you to swing the other direction real fast because a bunch of employees will quit because they're not getting big enough paychecks. And you can't just create demand out of thin air either. Now, we want to have as many marketing levers as we can. So if we have all this capacity, we go find the customers really quick. But if we don't find them fast enough, the inverse is going to happen really fast. So to be a happy business owner, capacity has to equal demand, or at least as close as humanly possible. The closer we get that, and we all feel it at certain points in our business. I'm sure you've had a Keith where you like go to bed at night and you just have a smile on your face and like life is great. And if you ever think at what's happening in those times, capacity equals demand. When you lay awake all night and your brain's just a going, it's usually because capacity doesn't equal demand. And it can be in your service business, but it might just be with a bunch of to-dos that you have on your plate because you don't have enough capacity for all these demands that are hitting you. Or if the inverse happens just in your personal life and you have all this capacity, but not enough stuff going on and not enough things demanding you, 
you're also like, I need to go do something, right? What's happening? Why don't I have something to do? Do I need to be worried? Do I need to go create something? Why is nobody calling? So even in our personal lives, like when we're the happiest is when our capacity equals the demands on us and our business is the same way. And no matter which way it goes, one way or the other, we just feel it. We know it's happening and it makes us ornery. And then we bring ornery business owner to the business, which usually causes that formula to go one way or the other even more. So it is the magic bullet. It's the magic formula. And if you know that and you're intentional about it and you run your business that way, it's not going to be all like rose and sunshine, but it's going to be a hell of a lot happier place to be every day. That's for sure. Bro, I like that. That's good. I'm going to meditate on that. That's the thing that I say. I'm going to meditate on that. Capacity equals demand. Actually, I want to ask a quick question about that. So what if your phone's blowing up off the hook and so much to the point where you can't take care of all these customers and you're just kind of skimming the cream off the top and you feel like that's capacity meeting demand for you? Can it be different for different people? I think so. It depends on your expectations, right? That can be super stressful if it's because you just had an employee or two employees and they just quit on you. And so now you can't answer the phone because you're the one out there doing the work and you're trying to scale this business and you feel like you just went backwards, right? If the plan is that you're not going to hire people and your phone's just blowing up too much anyway, then it just creates this dynamic of like, should I be raising my prices? Should I hire somebody? Like, I'm not really spending a whole lot on marketing, but should I shut down all my marketing? And if I do, then six months from now or a month from now or six weeks from now, am I going to have any work left? So maybe I don't shut off my marketing. I'm starting to get disgruntled people posting negatively about me on social media because I don't answer my phone. So it's going to create stress. Even if you don't intend on growing your business, if you have more demand than you can handle, it'll get to you. It'll stress you out at some point because it's going to start raising all these questions and it's going to piss people off if they're trying to use you and they can't. In today's world, they're going to find a place to post something negative about you. And like, no matter how thick our skin is, that eats us all up, right? Like we read a one-star Google review and we lose sleep over that shit. I think I was trying to make myself feel better because at the end of last year, we had so much demand that we just stopped answering the mm-hmm. phone and I was overwhelmed. And we had 875 missed phone calls by the time the first snow hit because... Because of the world we live in. Demand is off the hook. And it was beating me up, bro. I had to just at some point turn off yep. the switch of caring because it was stressing me out so bad. So, But that's what I mean. That's <laughs> capacity right. equals demand. It stresses you out like crazy. It does. It's not a bad thing. I mean, if we think about what stress is, right? It's our body's natural reaction to like, hey, Keith, you have something that needs attention, right? You have something that needs attention. And like stress is just this biological reaction to us to like, there's a freaking tiger about to eat us. So something needs our attention. That's all stress is. And so if we like ignore the tiger, it's just going to stress us out more. We just got to solve the tiger. We got to handle the tiger. So you might handle it by hiring people. You might handle it by like selling your leads to somebody else that's just getting started. But if you ignore it, it's just going to stress you out more, which it probably did. Yeah. An and then stream and you, of tigers. And you feel like you're letting people down, right? As business owners, we always put ourselves last. We put our employees first. We put our customers first. We put our family first. We always put ourselves last. And so when we are not upholding something to somebody that we feel like we like owe it to, like our customer, it stresses us out, man. And that's okay. Bro, amazing distinction. Thank you for that. That was amazing. All right, number six. I think we're on five. Oh, yeah, five. We're on five. The inflection point of scaling. The inflection point of scaling. The inflection point of scaling with Dan Plata. I wanted to talk about this after the magic formula because this is where the magic formula, this is where bookkeeping starts to get relevant. This is where the magic formula starts to get really relevant because this is like a perfect transition. What just happened to you last year is exactly this inflection point where demand is greater than capacity. And we're like, should we go? Should we not go? Should we go? Should we not go? And there's all these pros and cons. There's so much benefit to staying small. You don't have employees to worry about. Employees are really freaking stressful. You have less customers to worry about. You get to be super choosy about your customers. You don't need any infrastructure. You can run it from your home. You don't need a person in the office, really. You can use a virtual assistant. Your recruiting costs are non-existent because you're not hiring a bunch of employees. Your employee engagement is non-existent. Your repairs and maintenance is probably less because you don't have 19-year-old kids out running your equipment, beating the shit out of it. So Smashing your trucks. And even after like a couple of years, you hardly have to market. Like word mm-hmm. of mouth is enough. So yeah, you still have the cost of you going to do the work, but you can grow 
a solopreneur style business, depending on which industry you're in, to anywhere between like 100 to 300,000 of revenue or more in some industries just with you. And you can do it super profitably because you don't have all these investments to make because it's just you. You don't need to invest in all the employees or the next customer, so on and so forth. So tons of pros, right? To staying small and not trying to scale. But there's a handful of cons too, which is you have all the risk. If you get hurt, the business ain't making money anymore, right? So all of a sudden you need a huge disability policy because you still have to take care of people. And if it's just you and you're the only one generating an income, if you get hurt, the business goes away, right? The business is not making money when you're not there. And you're just the hamster on the wheel. You're the only thing that can make that business make money. So even when you're on vacation, you feel guilty that the business isn't running. You can't leave it. You can't mentally leave it. You can't, I mean, we were talking earlier, like there's just points in your business life where you have to just not give an F and you can't not give an F when you're there every single day and the business is 100% dependent on you. And so you have limited upside. When the business scales, you have unlimited upside. There's plenty of problems with scaling business. I'll get to those too. But when you don't scale, like the world is not your oyster. You can only make so much money because there's so many hours in a day. You can like maximize it by taking on only certain clients and only taking on the highest paying stuff and only the most profitable stuff. But at the end of the day, there's always a ceiling on how much you can do. We like go through those cons and we're like, man, my phone is blowing up. I have all this demand. I really ought to go hire people and start scaling this business. And there's tons of pros to that. It's the opposite of all the cons from not scaling, right? All of a sudden, the business can make money while we're sitting on a beach somewhere. All of a sudden, if we get hurt, it's totally fine. The business still makes money and we can afford the insurance to pay for that stuff. All of a sudden, we have this freedom that we create. So we get to spend more time with our families because we don't have to be the one out there doing the work, doing the this, doing the that. There's more to that list, but there's tons of pros to scaling the business. And so we start like leaning in that direction because why wouldn't we want all that? We got our phone blowing up. Why wouldn't we want to go chase that? But all these cons, all of a sudden we have a bunch of employees to worry about. And we got enough problems ourselves. But one thing that happens when you have employees is you adopt all their problems too, whether you want them or not. You could say, hey, personal stays at home, work stays at work, but people are people and you get all of them, whether you like it or not, whether they're depressed, whether they're happy, whether they're on drugs, whatever, they're bringing it to work. You can't control that. They're bringing it. Yep. Did I, did I strike a nerve there? <laughs> yeah, like finding drugs underneath the seat of my other work truck. Yeah. While I was driving it, <laughs> and I go to clean out the truck, and I find this little tiny, like, tin container, and I go, what the hell is this? And I open it up, and there's a little white pill in there. I don't know. It was probably... Who knows? And all of a sudden, just, like, my heart starts beating, and I feel upset and pissed off and betrayed and thinking about how I could catch a court case and obviously I threw it in the garbage and it's just taking up brain space. <laughs> it's just taking up brain space, man. So you start scaling the business, you have those problems, you have all these other investments to make that you didn't have to make before, right? All of a sudden you need a place to rent. You need to spend way more on marketing. You need to spend a whole bunch on office people. You need to spend a whole bunch on employee engagement and stuff like that. You're making all these investments and your job just did a 180. You used to be a window cleaner. You used to be a landscaper. You used to be a pressure washer. You used to be a home cleaner. You used to lay concrete. Whatever it was that the task was, that was your job. Now your job is leading people, maybe answering phones, building culture, building systems and processes. Your job just totally changed. You were good at the job that you had. That was why you started the company. But do you really want an administrative, managerial, CEO type of job For a lot of people, that isn't why they got into the business. They don't want to run a business. They want to go outside and do the work and be outside if that's where their work happens. So one of the cons is the thing that you loved that got you into it is no longer your job. You don't even get to do that. You could scale a business and still be out in the field, but it's just tricky to do because you can't see everything that's going on. So all of a sudden, your job just totally changed. So all of a sudden, you start stacking up all these cons of scaling a business, and you're really damned if you do, damned if you don't. You're kind of a dumbass if you don't scale it, and you're a moron if you do scale it. You're just buying a different set of problems. Now, eventually, a scaled business has way more upside, can make way more money, can buy you way more freedom. But the path to get there is not just, I think I'll scale my business and throw some money at it, make some investments, and see what happens. Like a couple of years, and we'll be a million, $2 million business. There's so much pain and suffering and learning and screwing up. I was telling you a story when we were sitting at lunch. I was going on a family like long weekend just to trip back to my folks' place and we had to delay it by a day because I had an employee that was out cleaning a roof and texted me that they were going to jump off of it. And 
hour and a half away from my house and I got to decide, right? Well, I was about to leave with my family, but now I got to go rescue an employee and hope they don't do something crazy at a customer's house. I care about the employee. I care about the customer. I care about my family. Like, what do we do? We just have all these weird pressures as a business owner when we scale. We don't just scale a business because we said so, right? It's not that easy. It comes with tons of hard work, tons of lessons, tons of mistakes. The just one different thing journey. I can think of is uh, somebody being apprehensive or afraid to scale as they try to do it a little bit and then they realize all the pain that comes with that mm-hmm. working and massaging yourself through those situations or you know ironing those things out is because it starts to bleed over into the personal life and into the family, into the marriage because there's all these unknowns. It's brand new stuff that you're doing. And so you said people will start to lean into that and then they'll pull back down to one truck. They'll be like, screw that. Yeah. You're just not prepared for the onslaught of decisions. Mm -hmm. The business gets really messy, right? Like you used to see everything and you used to be able to run it out of your bank account and now you can't. So that's scary as hell because you see the bank account going down, but you don't really know why. And you maybe didn't start your bookkeeping yet. So like everything in the business changed and that was a lot of work and that was scary. And then you look at your bank account going backwards and you're like, man, I'm working twice as hard. And like, I don't know where my money's going, but it's not coming back to me. So why am I working so hard to make no money? And the first thing that always happens when we scale, and this is why I call it like the inflection point is, A, we got to decide, are we going to totally change the job that we have? Like, is that the job we want? And B, are we ready to lose a bunch of money? It's another investment. It's a huge investment in something that could be great. But what if we are not good at it? What if we don't like it? first thing that happens is we go from making $100,000 when it was just us to maybe making like $30,000 or $0 the minute we hire a couple other people to do that work. And we got to like try to grow this business around them and they quit. And then we got to replace them. And this like herky jerk, we don't know how long it's going to be before we like get to the next step and start making money again. Hopefully it's a week, but it could be a year or two, right? And like, how long can we stay solvent? How long can we have like money in our bank account to like last through that trough? And how hard can we push to get our asses through it? It's a scary ass unknown. Cash flow purgatory. Cash flow purgatory. I got two other things to hit on, but that's literally what I call these like troughs. It's not just right when you start. There's these things all the way through business. I call it the purgatories of scaling because there's just always these weird inflection points where we have to go backwards before we can go forwards. And it's scary and, and it sucks. And it's worse if you don't know that it's going to happen, right? If you start scaling your business and you don't know you're about to lose money and go backwards that's when people get cold feet and jump back on the truck and are like, no way, I'm not doing that. I tried doing that and it was miserable and my employees sucked and my equipment all broke and they lost stuff and they left it behind and my customers were all pissed because our quality slipped. I'm getting back out in the field. Oh, and by the way, with all that, I was making $0 because I had to pay them the money for all these screw ups. Why don't and, I just go back and do and it And you might be coming home sharing that with, like, with your wife mm-hmm. and then you're stressed out and you're bringing all that stress in the home and now your whole world's melting down. Bro. Well, yeah, because you're working twice as many hours. Making no so money. So you're making no money. You're bringing more problems home. Your attitude's shitty and you're working twice as hard and your wife's like, why are you doing this to well, us? Why would you hire a guy like that? <laughs> yeah. Why would you even hire a guy like that? What is wrong with you? I should have read the sign that he wore that said, I'm a crazy son of a bitch and I'm going to try to tear your business down. <laughs> but I didn't think it was serious. I remember I had, uh, I would never come home and talk about, well, actually, in the beginning, I would talk about all of it. But then after a couple of years, I learned not to touch a hot stove. <laughs> just and, took a couple of years. Yeah. I pull up in the driveway and I don't ever even talk about it as soon as I just shut it off. And leave my phone in my truck the first hour that I get home and I go eat dinner and then I'll come to grab my phone. But and I don't have a uh, hundred employees like you guys are talking about, but I've learned this one guy was working for me. We had two trucks on a job site and he's working and working. He's got to pull the truck up. And for some reason, he backed the truck up and had a door open. And so he backs up the truck into the other truck <laughs> and smashes both trucks. <laughs> And double whammy. I think you call that the double whammy. Yeah. And then another guy is driving the truck and trailer and no, same guy. He leaves the doors open and the trailer doors are going like this on the road (laughs) as he's hitting curbs and cones are flying out and shit. And then this guy had quite the driving skill set. Yeah. He couldn't drive (laughs) drive no more. I had another guy drive and that guy, this was my fault because the brakes needed to be fixed on a truck and they still worked, but they needed to be fixed. And he rear-ended an off-duty cop oh. and then fled the scene. Oh, my God. So I come outside and I hear sirens and there's four cops surrounding my house. And they got him and my truck with it running and the door open. And the front end has got a dent on it. Yeah. 
And I came out, I was like, well, why would you do that? Like, And I was like, somehow they just let him go and nothing happened because it was an off-duty cop and he liked me. And then the guy's like, by the way, can I get a landscaping quote? <laughs> so I just paid the guy's deductible and got a landscape quote out yeah. of the deal. Yeah, it might uh, paid for itself. I, now, tangent, I uh, have rear-ended a not off-duty cop before. I'm right there with the boy and I'm a pretty good driver, but all of us make a mistake or two. <sighs> Damn. Yeah. He was pissed. Dude was pissed. But long story short, his supervisor had to come like right up the ticket for me hitting him. The supervisor almost hit me because it was like just a glare ice rink around a corner. And the cop was there because there was a car accident. And so like I tried to stop, but I couldn't stop. I bounced uh, off of his car. Because it was ice. Because it was just freaking glare ice. And I asked the cop. He came out F-bombing me. Like he was so pissed when I re- and, and like, okay, whatever. I asked him like, can I, there's a parking lot right here. Can I like pull off so I get out of the way? He's like, no, you stay the F right there. I'm, like, all right. you know, I'm not going to argue with this guy. He's pretty fired up. His whatever, I don't know. I don't know all the terms of their ranking, right? His lieutenant or whatever it is. Slid past, like should have hit me, but actually missed me and slid past me because it was so icy. He turned into the parking lot and he walked over. Dude looks like Doc from Back to the Future. And he's smoking a stogie. Like you can tell he didn't plan on leaving the office. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious how the one guy is so fired up. This guy that comes, the superior dude is just like super laid back. And he like pokes his head and he's like, why don't you guys pull on over here? And I was like, that's what I'm saying. Like, we shouldn't be sitting here. This is like a death trap because the people behind me kept hitting the curb, right? They would see me. It's like the one dude just had me blocking for him, basically. I pull off. Me and the lieutenant are talking. And within 30 seconds, another car comes and smacks that cop car. And he gets out. And he's like, you got to be effing kidding me. And I was just like, oh, my life. It was so I was so down for a sec. I mean, when like a cop starts f bombing you, you really feel like a piece of shit. Uh-huh. And then like his lieutenant started making me feel better. And then this other car comes and hits that that cop car, and he just blew up. And I'm like 50 yards away, just listening to him f bomb that guy. And I was like, oh, this is just so great. Like this is perfect. At least I got a story out of it. It's yeah. totally worth it. Totally worth it. I can empathize with your employee. I didn't hit and run. <laughs> I mean, probably couldn't have run anywhere because my tires would just been spinning on this damn ice rink that I was on. But I've hit a cop car. I got that T-shirt. There's probably a T-shirt for that. There's probably a T-shirt for that. Man, we can make one. <laughs> You're what? <laughs> Ashley can whip us. Up. Ashley can whip us one up. Dude, you were dead serious just now. I can picture it. <laughs> All right, sweet. Are you still on the inflection point of scaling? Or I, you think we, to- I think we hit the inflection point of scaling. I think we're on to now. Like when we're gonna scale, what's the first thing that we got to do? Hmm. First thing we got to do is go find some more demand. Right? Capacity equals demand. If we're gonna scale, a we like have to grow capacity, but we also have to grow demand. And there's no point in hiring a bunch of people if we don't have customers lined up. Now, this is a little bit different depending on the industry that you're in as to like which of these you do first. And I'll get to the employee side of it in a second. If you're doing landscaping, window cleaning, more of like transactional type of stuff, you can book business out and fill your schedule at maybe two, four, six weeks. And once you go past like six weeks, nobody's signing up, right? Depending on where you are in the country. So you can build a runway for yourself. And so marketing is kind of the first thing that you want to do. You want to start filling up your schedule so that you can have the customers booked that are going to pay for the employee, that are going to pay for the supplies, that are going to pay for the tools that you need to go do that thing. If on the other hand, you're running a like recurring service model, maybe lawn care or maybe maid service, now you almost need the employee first because you don't want to go sell it if you don't have somebody to go do the work, if it's a recurring service. So if you're doing recurring services, you almost need to go find the employee first. And once you have the capacity, then you like put your foot on the gas pedal of marketing to try to get the demand. So I'm going to first talk about the marketing side of it. And then number seven, we'll be talking about the employee side of it. But if we're doing the transactional stuff, if we're doing the window cleaning, the landscaping stuff, the pressure washing stuff, if it's like a one-time job, first thing we got to go do is start filling up our schedule. And the most important part of marketing is the math. How much does it take you to spend to go get that next client. We call it the client acquisition cost, or you'll see it as CAC, and there's a few different acronyms or whatever for it. But what you're looking for is, what's my investment to go find that next client? And my rule for this, I'm not saying this is going to be right for everybody, but just this is like a mathematical rule that works really well in the home service industry, is we can spend about 30% of our revenue on marketing, which seems really high to some people. If your average job is $300, that's saying you can spend about $100 on just marketing to go get that next client. If your average job size is 1000 bucks, you can spend $300 to go find that next client. The reason that that works, and it works over and over and over again, 
is if we have a scaled business, if we have a scaled window cleaning business, generally, we're going to pay about 15% in marketing overall. So my business in Minneapolis did just over a million dollars this year. We spent like almost exactly 150,000 in marketing. We're like right at 15%. The net income of the business should be right around 15% as well in a window cleaning business. That's where we kind of want it to fall. Different industries, a little higher, a little lower, just depending on, on where you are in your business. But these are good general targets. When we sell a new client, we take that 15% overall spend on marketing plus the 15% net profit. And we basically say like, we'll pay it all in marketing the first time we do work for a customer. And that's because we don't need to make money off that customer. We're fine breaking even on every brand new customer in our business because brand new customers still give us referrals and they repeat. So the lifetime value of that client is still massive. So we're willing to basically break even in year one on a brand new client because we know that they're going to refer us and they're going to repeat. And that's where we make our money because we don't have to market to those people. We maybe send them an email blast or a text blast or something like that. But it's almost free for us to market to people that are in our client list. It's expensive to go find new clients, especially when we start scaling. It's like, how much money should I spend on marketing? If I'm going to go do 200,000 in revenue, 300,000 in revenue, 400,000 in revenue, it's okay to spend 30%. If you're going to go do 500,000 in revenue, it's okay to spend 150,000 on marketing. You'll make $0 in your business for a year, but now next year you're going to have so many damn clients you're going to be able to market to them for free. And so not to say that you should go spend 150000 We did in our business very early on, and we went from like 150000 to 500000 just like that. It was a year of not making any money, but we just like, now we're 500000 bucks. And when I talk about the purgatories of scaling, that's like a sweet spot where you can be pretty damn profitable. So that marketing investment and understanding how much you can spend and what you need to get out of that how much you can spend to go find that next client is super important because if you don't get that right and if you're too gun shy to spend on the marketing, you're stuck at that inflection point where you like try to get off the truck and try to start hiring people, but you don't have enough demand because you're not spending enough on marketing to fill their boat up. And you really need like two people at least to replace you because they need to both go out and make money so that you get a little bit after you pay them. So you really like got to dial in your marketing so that you can scale up fast enough. Because if you don't scale up fast enough, you stay in that first purgatory where you're just losing money hand over fist because you're paying it to them. You don't get to pay yourself. So when we talk about ROI, we hear that term all, all the time, but a lot of people confuse it for like revenue, but it's not really revenue. It's return on investment. It's how much net income do we get when we invest in that marketing? And so it's important not to just spend $400 of marketing on a $500 client like, yeah, you made a return revenue-wise on it, but we can only spend 30% to even break even on it, right? In our business model, we can only spend 30% of the new client revenue. And so when we talk about return on investment. If we can get that number 30% or lower, we get a return in year one. And that's pretty cool. There's not a lot of businesses out there in the world where you can get a return in year one on your investment. Think about if you invested in Amazon stock. Let's say you put a thousand bucks into that. Is that going to pay you back $1,001 of dividends in year one without you having to sell the stock? There's no way. No. There's no way. In our business, it can. We can invest in marketing at 30% and go get that client. And we don't even have to draw money out of the business. That revenue, after we run it through the business model, will pay us more than the 30% that we got. And we'll make a profit on that in year one, above and beyond our investment. It's like the freaking coolest stock market in the world. So when we talk about marketing, 30% is that magic number. If you're too far below it, it just says you're not pushing hard enough and you're probably not growing fast enough. If you're spending like 10% of revenue per client, like maybe. I mean, this would be a given that you understand how to do marketing and advertising and you understand how to speak in the proper messaging of the customer avatar and how to pull them in to lower your customer acquisition costs yeah. based off the way you communicate. Yeah, you still got to get your marketing right. You still need to know which avenues to put it in. But mathematically now, you know how much you can spend on it and still make money. Here's kind well, of my- How do you know mathematically when there's free marketing or low cost, no cost marketing that can totally outperform the most blowing tons of money on marketing that's not resonating and not working? That's a whole other science in and of itself. Is this assuming that somebody knows a decent enough about marketing because they've ran their business enough to dial it into Yeah. It. I mean, I th I'm not a marketing expert. I won't pretend to be. I'm a math expert. So my math says you can spend that much. It still needs to convert though, right? And if it's not converting, you'll end up spending way more than 30%. 
So 30% is kind of your threshold to know if the things you're doing aren't working. There is, especially when you're starting out, like the trade-off between your labor and your money. When you're first starting out doing yard signs, doing flyers, doing door knocking, you're using your labor. It feels really cost effective, but we like value ourselves at zero dollars. If we said our time is worth a hundred bucks an hour, like that's some of the most expensive marketing we can do in reality, but we just don't count our time, right? I've done that door hangering tons of neighborhoods and even having people come with me. And at the end of the day, I did all the math and realized that was the dumbest thing ever to go out on foot and paying people with me. Mm Mm-hmm. Why did I do that? It's expensive, but early on. But I'm not saying it was dumb because it worked and I got customers who yeah. turned repeat customers. Yep. So actually it, it did work thinking about how if you can spend the first time you get a customer, if they turn into a long-term customer and give you referrals, yep. then it's actually worth it. It's all it's, part of it's growing It's amazing. The I mean, like even though when you do that math, it was probably super expensive if you like value your time and how much you got to pay these guys accordingly, it still pays off. It's amazing how much you can spend on marketing and still make money because of how valuable that client income stream is. But even the boots on the ground stuff, we're the most expensive employee. If we're saying we're anything less than a hundred bucks an hour, we're fooling ourselves, right? Like that's what I charge when I send somebody else out to go clean windows. That's how much I charge the client. So I'm probably worth a hell of a lot more than that. So point being is, yeah, there's kind of like a hierarchy of marketing that you're going to put into place. I can hit on a few of those, but the point is no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing Google ads, whether you're doing Google local services, whether you're running Facebook ads, whether you're doing yard signs, clip flyers, rock flyers, what, you know, like everybody's kind of got their own thing. If you're door knocking, the math is always the same, mm. 30% or less 30% on a brand new less. customer, on a brand new customer. So if your average job size is 500 bucks, you should be around like $150 spent to go find that next client or less. And so if you know what your average job size is, then you know where that 30% threshold is not to go over for your client acquisition cost. Then you can test, right? Yeah. How how much do I need to spend on Facebook ads? How much do I need to spend on those yard signs plus what I'm paying somebody else to go put them out or me at a hundred bucks an hour putting them out, right? Or the flyers or the door knocking or the Google. I think I already said Google or the radio ads. Like we do radio and TV in Minneapolis. It's super expensive, but we can do that same math. You know, we're, we're spending 30 to 40,000 bucks at a clip instead of 300 or 3,000, but the math doesn't change. It's the same thing. One other point on marketing, as you start to grow and you do more awareness marketing, I like to look at it as there's like the direct pull the lever and customer spits out marketing. There's a lot of marketing that's more like awareness. Billboards don't convert, but they're awareness. Radio ads can convert, but they're more like awareness. And TV ads especially might convert a little bit, but they're more awareness. So when we're measuring our marketing spend, one thing that we do internally, and actually I've got a sheet that I'm going to get out on my website for anybody to go download so they can do this by source. But what I find is when we do marketing on TV or radio or do some of that awareness marketing, the rest of our marketing starts to look really profitable, really profitable. Like our Google ad average acquisition cost is like 38 bucks. That's actually, isn't that? It's like incredibly low. But it's not because we're that great at Google ads. Ah. It's because we do all this radio advertising. And when they search our name, they click our damn Google ad. They're not going to scroll down to the organic thing, but you know they're going to go type it into Google. They might dial the number that they heard, but chances are they just remember our name and then they Google us and then they click our Google ad. Ah, so it's not like a one-off promotion. You're running a marketing campaign. Yeah, we got stuff on this radio station and that and that TV. And so when you do awareness marketing, that acquisition cost by source starts to become less relevant. And you're actually looking at it on average across everything because like we shoot for $150 acquisition cost in our business. Our average job size is right around $450. So we're like playing with that 30% level for new customers. But our acquisition costs on some of the TV and radio is like pushing 400 bucks. It's like for a new client, we're spending more on the marketing than they pay in revenue. But if we look at our total portfolio of marketing, the $150,000 we spent last year, our acquisition cost was like $153 per new client. Our target's $150. Ah. So it's like we're getting the benefit. Now, we might look at these four radio stations and this TV station and say, well, these two are in the 200 range and this one's in the 300 range and this one's at 500. Like we're cutting that one out. That one's not paying off from what we can tell compared to the other ones. But just because it's a little bit high doesn't mean it's not working. Like it starts to get a little more complex in that case because you kind of got to look at the full portfolio when you start doing awareness marketing. When you're just doing direct Facebook ads or Google ads or flyers or yard signs, it's a little more easy to tell if it's working or not working and what the specific acquisition cost of that thing is. But the rule that I like to use, 30% for a new client. I like that. Just makes it simple. So you need to know 
your customer acquisition cost, the average ticket per customer. Mm -hmm. So round up all your customers and find out the full jobs of the year divided by the amount of customers. Yep. To find your average ticket price. And then the lifetime value, the LTV of the customer. I don't even use just like the one time, not the lifetime value, because I just need to make sure that we at least break even on them in year one. I don't want to lose money in year mm-hmm. one, but I'm okay with breaking even because I know that the lifetime value then like, and there's people out there that would argue you could spend more because of the lifetime value for sure. I just don't want to go backwards. Like that's oh, like kind of where I draw the line. does that shit and they'll be like, our lifetime value is actually 20000 per Yeah. Customer. So they'll go in the hole, right? And I'm like, I got bills to pay. I got a family to feed. I don't want to go in the hole. I'm not willing to like to go backwards, right? Because I have this investment, unlike investing in the stock market where I might get a dividend each year, but I'm not getting my money back until I sell the thing. In our business, I can put money into marketing and I get my money back in year one. I'll get all of that money back, but I just want to make sure I get it all back and don't lose any, right? So if I go over 30%, I'm going to be like investing in the lifetime value and I'm going to go backwards this year to go forwards later. That might be the right decision for somebody that's got deep pockets or maybe their significant other makes a bunch of money. And so then their business, they can afford to not make money this year. Like everything's relative, right? But I just kind of draw the line. I like, I just don't want to go backwards. I want to keep going forwards. But I do understand that this lifetime value is a real thing. And referrals are a real thing. And repeats are huge in our business. I think we're at like 60%. I just use all my repeats to pay for my new clients. That's huge. That's huge. I love that, bro. So I think we covered the ROI of marketing. Is there anything else? I think we got the ROI of marketing. That was really good, bro. You want to know what's real trippy? Huh? It's the exact same thing for employees. Hiring employees is just marketing in reverse, right? So we have an acquisition cost to acquire a client. We have an acquisition cost to acquire an employee. It's capacity equals demand all over again. We have to figure out how much it costs us to go find a client. And then we got to know how much it costs us to go find an employee. And we're doing the same shit. We might be doing boots on the ground stuff. We might be handing out business cards. We might be posting socially on like Facebook, just trying to like figure out if there's somebody in our network that needs a job. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Then we start maybe putting some ads out on ZipRecruiter or paying for ads on Facebook or paying for Indeed ads. It's the exact same thing we do in Mark. We've even done a radio ad to try to hire people. It's the exact same thing we do on marketing. The funny thing is the mistake a lot of guys make early on is they post job descriptions. They forget that they're marketing. If your marketing material... Because you guys have a recruiting agency. You know about this stuff. This is what we do. This is what we do. Dan but, Plata. But if you just... If you're marketing to your clients and all you did was like, a, here's what we do. There's no sex appeal, right? There's no differentiation. If you just say, we come out and we clean your windows and we do this and we do that and we do that. And here's our cost. There's just no sex appeal, right? If you just sent them a letter with just on white paper that just said this. So many people's job ads are just straight up job descriptions of like, here's what you're going to do at the job and here's what you can't do or you get fired. And then, you know, maybe here's how much money you make and come on in. And there's just no sex appeal to it. They forget that they're writing an ad. And the crazy thing about recruiting is it's even so much more competitive. When we're marketing to clients, we're just competing with each other, right? Like the client has like a substitute that maybe they won't get a landscaping project because maybe they'll spend the money on something else. But if they're going to get the landscaping project done, we're competing with other landscaping companies. On the recruiting side, we're competing with Amazon and Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's and any warehouse or any manufacturing company. We are literally competing with everybody for our labor. And so Sean, who's our recruiting director, always says, it's the biggest sale you will ever make in your life. Hiring an employee is the biggest sale you ever make in your life. Our average client is usually maybe a couple thousand bucks worth of revenue in a year. On average, some are smaller, some commercial ones get bigger, right? Our average employee is worth $100,000, $200,000, $300,000. That's how much revenue they create. They're so much more valuable than a client, and they're going to touch all these clients. Like, if we get a really good employee, the positive impact they can make on all these clients. Likewise, if we get a really shitty employee, the negative impact (laughs) they can make on all these clients. So it's funny, we get so obsessed with the clients when really the employees, if we're going to scale the business and go past this inflection point, the employee is by far the most costly thing. And anybody that scaled a business, I think everybody would agree with this. Once your business is like scaled or scaling, you no longer lose sleep over clients. If a client leaves or is upset or posts a one-star Google review, you don't give a shit. If an employee leaves or like causes drama in the office or you're not sure if they're going to show up tomorrow, that's some real stress. Because your business depends on them. We're in the people business. When you start scaling, you're no longer in the pressure washing business. You're no longer in the landscaping business. You're in the people business. You're a leader. You're a systems person. You're a culture person. You're no longer in the task anymore. 
So when it comes to employees, one of the areas where you just like have the wrong mindset generally is we look at it as we have something they need versus they have something we need, right? We need them more than they need us, especially in this labor market. We also tend to look at it as we shouldn't have to pay money to find them because they need an income. So they should be trying to find us. In reality, like we're, we're spending all this money on marketing to go find the next client. And then we have to spend like a few hundred bucks to go find an employee. And we kind of gripe about it. And we say like, oh man, Indeed ads are getting so expensive or this is getting so expensive. In reality, if we spent $5,000 to go find that employee, the amount of revenue tied to them, right? They can do, like I said, between a hundred and three hundred thousand of revenue in a year. So if we spent five thousand dollars to find an employee and get them trained up and whatever, that's nothing. That's amazing acquisition cost if you think about it. We're willing to pay thirty percent to go find a client, and I'm talking about paying like a couple percent to go find an employee. And an employee is everything that my business is built on. If they don't show up, if they show up drunk or hungover or high or whatever it is, they can have a serious negative impact. So if I'm not willing to like invest in them and find the right person for the team, that's like the best use of money that we have. But it, we're in this weird, obviously like a crazy labor market now where it's super expensive to find people. It's super important to find people. And there's not a lot of people out there yet. Like most people that I see interacting about this are like still trying to find people for free on Indeed or posting in their own Facebook groups, and they're just not willing to invest in it. True story, last year in our Minneapolis business, we spent $35,000 on job ads. It kind of takes your breath away a little bit, doesn't it? 35 Gs. 35,000 bucks. We spent 150 on marketing, and I'm sitting here telling you about how much more important the employees are than the clients, and I spent one-fifth as much on them. Kind of makes me feel shitty after I say it like that, though. Like, if the employees are that valuable, and we spent more than anybody I know, and we did just over a million bucks. Now, we also hired 45 people. We had a team of 14. So we're in the hire fast, fire fast mode. We're going to assess them, interview them quick, see if we think they're a good fit, bring them in. Really, the first week is how you tell if they're a good fit, not during the interview. You're just trying to find out you know, like how crazy they are in the interview. But the real interview happens the first week. Do they like it? And are they willing to stick around? It's kind of like your first date type of thing. Like, what's the vibe here? And so we bring them in and we kind of, we don't tell them it's their true interview, but that's kind of the point. And so we're just going to hire as many people as we possibly can to test them out, see what they're made of. But last year we started with two people and we knew we had to get up to 14. And we did. That 1.1 million never would have happened had we not invested that 35,000. If we look back, that was a better investment than anything we did on the marketing side. The marketing hit home. That we had some hits, we had some misses for sure, but the best money we spent was that recruiting money. And the funny thing was, the year before we spent 20,000, and I remember saying to Sean, I was like, man, that was a lot of money. I'm glad we won't have to do that again. And the next year, we spent almost double. So it is the thing that unleashes your business to be able to grow. And especially in this labor market, my message is just don't be afraid to spend that money. We were spending on average a thousand bucks on ads really like per hire, right? We spent 35,000. We hired like, I think it's 42 or 45 people. So we were almost spending a thousand bucks just per hire. And we only kept 12 of them. We went from two guys to 14 And you have to pay attention to all those ads. You respond to those ads, interview those employees, go through the interview process, and then onboard them and train them and get them set up and on payroll and insured and all that. It's a whole pile of stuff. So who's managing that full-time job in and of itself? Our recruiting department does a bunch of it. And our recruiting department can just like we do bookkeeping for a bunch of people, our recruiting department does that for a whole What's bunch of What's the name of, of that business? It's still Blue Sky Services. It's under the same administrative company as our bookkeeping. So we're both under Blue Sky Services. I just do all the demos on the bookkeeping side to get people acquainted I'll with that. I'll put a link below to that. Yep. Still yourblueskies.com. And you can go to yourblueskies.com slash Kelfus and find it too. I and love you, it. And you get the same half off because we don't discriminate. <laughs> yourblueskies.com slash Kelfus. It's all there. I love it. So... My point being, I don't have like a mathematical thing on this like I do for marketing. The math of employees is a little bit different. It's highly variable, right? As to how long they stick around and so on and so forth. But my point is, it's a mindset thing. We were talking about mindset earlier. You got to have the right mindset when it comes to trying to find employees that they are the thing that unleashes your business and allows you to scale. And if you're going to have capacity equals demand, it doesn't matter how much demand you generate, especially in this labor market, your business can only grow as well and as fast as the employees that you have. That's it. Doesn't matter how much demand you can go get. And when the labor market's super tight, it's almost worth hiring the employee. Like when the demand is out there, like it is now, like you said, your phone was ringing off the hook in the fall. 
you're damn near better off just going and hiring the employees and then figuring it out on the marketing side because the customers are everywhere. If you have the employees right now, you win. Your ceiling is unlimited. But if you don't have the employees, you can't go anywhere. You can't keep growing because there's nowhere to go with those phone calls. So, and I think it's unique right now given the labor market, but that is the ceiling. How many great employees do we have? That's the ceiling of our business. So while you're running the business and managing the marketing and the innovation and the sales and the administration and the payroll and dealing with the customers and managing the projects and getting the materials and getting installed and doing the quality control and all that, who is taking care of the onboarding and the training of the employees and make sure they have matching uniforms and signing all the documentation and making sure that they're driving records check with the DMV and sending them off for a drug test and verifying that, putting it in a file, and then make sure that the unemployment insurance agency and the work comp is all set up and all like, it's a full-time job just dealing with the employees. Yeah. See, I'm going to get all fired up right now. Yeah, the employees do that. Off. The employees do that. You have employees that do that. Yeah. At like, what point does the business make enough money yeah. for you to be able to afford that and how do you allocate a mathematical percentage for that? And if you've never done it before and you don't know what you're doing and you're a crappy leader or a great leader, how do you make those distinctions except trial by fire? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I find is a lot of the front end work, you could hire somebody like Blue Skies to do your recruiting for you. And then with that, we're doing all like the filtering to try to speed up that hiring process mm -hmm. so that our clients are only seeing like the good people to talk to. There's a lot of people clicking on your ads out there that are not worth your time. I just say last summer, even I'm on the phone with the t-shirt company to get more nice embroidered shirts. To get that shirt about hitting the rear end of a cop car made. That's probably what you're doing. It's going to be a sweet shirt. <laughs> yeah. So thanks. I derailed you there. Yeah. <laughs> You were on the phone with the t-shirt company. Yeah. So, and then, so I spent hundreds of dollars and then they send it's, but it's a different company I go with now. And then they send all of their sizes are off and now they're these big baggy swimming shirts. <laughs> yeah. And then 100% cotton. Just I don't got don't time breathe. Yeah, to return them. So then it's, it becomes a huge administrative issue yet. I got to sell these jobs. So you hire someone to deal with that. Right. So there's this like process of delegation as we scale. Yeah. The, when we immediately scale, part of why it sucks so much and part of why we work twice as hard and don't make any money is because scaling takes all of that, Yeah. which takes a bunch of time and you don't get to start delegating it until you get past that first purgatory of like getting a few employees on board. And then you can start delegating the field work and you can do a little bit more of that to get your next employee. And at some point you hire an office employee or you have a part-time virtual assistant that starts taking that stuff off of your plate. When we do recruiting, one of the things that we do, like I said, is all the filtering and stuff, but our applicant tracking system that we use does all the onboarding paperwork for them. So the W-4, the I-9, all the policy documents just get filled out automatically. Like the employee Wait, does what's it. the name of the software? What is this? So one system that we use is called Career Plug. Career Plug. That's like what our recruiting team uses. We're also starting to use Hire Who as an applicant tracking system. Hire Who. It's more automated. It's actually uh, Dominic Williams that owns and operates that. He's a janitorial guy. Super awesome dude. Super awesome system, and we're starting to switch some customers over to that. I don't think that one has onboarding yet, but you can also do onboarding in your payroll software often. So once you hire people, we use Gusto for payroll. Gusto can do the same like W4, I9, and can automate that stuff for you. So after you hire somebody, you put them into a system like that, and then they just fill out all that paperwork because there's nothing worse than like doing 45 minutes of paperwork with somebody and then they don't actually show up. Exactly. And you Wait, don't what does them. Gusto do again? Gusto is a payroll software. I know. Right? So you can use it as an onboarding system too. That's part of what they offer. So that when you hire somebody, you just send them the link. They go fill everything out online. So you don't need to sit down and do all the paperwork. With them. <sighs> I need to switch over to Gusto. I got a link for you. It's not a yourblueskies.com <laughs> slash Kelfis, but it's like a gusto.com slash blue skies. I've been using... <laughs> I've been using ADP forever and it works fine. Yeah. I wonder if they have that and I, I bet they do. know it. Yep. I bet they do. Oh my God. Gusto might be a little more cost effective. ADP is kind of pricey. I like ADP. We use it through our customers on the, I mean, we go into your ADP to probably look at your payroll report. So like we're used to going into payroll systems. Gusto is my favorite. They got, a, they got a pig. Like my employees love the pig. Animated pig that walks around. Big hit. It's a little more cost effective. I don't want to throw any other softwares under the bus, but it's like having a CRM that's just easier to use. Yeah. It's just like cleaner and easier. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So is that uh, enough about employees? What? The cost of employees? So the other one thing I would note there, because you laid out a whole bunch of stuff that you immediately have to deal with once you start scaling, right? There's one role that can take a lot of that shit off your plate as you scale. And the cool thing about this role 
is it doesn't need to be full time. When you hire people for the field, 99% of the time they're full time, right? Like you need them to be full time to free you up and you kind of need two of them. When you hire an office person, especially in today's world, that office person can generally do their job in their pajamas, in their basement or in their guest bedroom on a laptop, on a computer, whatever. There are so many people out there willing to work for a very fair price, working from home with flexibility that have more than enough skill sets because they probably either left the corporate world or they like ran their own business or they retired and they're just looking for like a little bit of work to do to like keep them engaged. That role is super easy to fill and it doesn't need to be full time. So it's super scalable. So like even before you hire your first person for the field, you might hire an office manager or virtual assistant for five to 10 hours a week to deal with the t-shirt thing that you mentioned, to go deal with the payroll system, to go do the onboarding paperwork so that when you hire somebody, you just say, hey, Ricky, here you go. Here's the stuff. Go enter it in the system. That office role, generally, here's what I find. A, it's flexible in that a lot of the stuff they can do whenever. Like if they're answering the phone, they kind of got to be there during business hours. But a lot of the stuff that they do, whether it's adding somebody into the payroll system or dealing with the t-shirt thing or whatever, they can kind of do it whenever, as long as whoever they're trying to deal with is open. So they have a lot more flexibility, which makes it easier to hire that person. It's easy to hire them part-time. There's plenty of people that just want five to 10 hours a week. And we hired a gal last year that started at 20, but she was like, yeah, I could work five. I could work 40. Just let me know what you need. I'm in. She crushes it. But she has like this total flexible range. She's retired. When she's got the grandkids, she's not working. But other than that, she has tons of flexibility. They are generally more cost effective than the person in the field. The person in the office gets paid a little bit lower wage than the person out in the field. And therefore, it takes a lower level task off of your plate. If we're just looking at the monetary value, you're more valuable out in the field doing that because the customer is willing to pay more for it than you are in the office. And so in a lot of cases, it makes sense to go get this office role filled so that you can start scaling and train up that person in the field and then have the resources so that you're not dealing with all the shit that you said. Office person in place so then you can go in the field and get that iron out and get the person trained up in the field. So now you get the office person in the field guy. And you're still working in the field with that guy generating revenue, yeah, right? Like the first thing you do doesn't have to be go hire people in the field so you can get into the office. Because when you go to the office, you're actually adding less value just because you can pay somebody less than you have to pay that person out there. Being in the office, I don't like admin work. I do a ton of it and I don't like it. So in my business, Jill's office answering the phones. You guys are doing the books. I'm doing the sales and marketing. And I got a couple guys in the field helping. And then I'm in the truck all day on the phone and I work get them started or show them and then help them at the end of the day, mm-hmm. wrap up if we got to get the hell out of there. I mean, I'm getting materials and dropping it off. So I'm like what they call level two, stage two business. Yep. And it's like, yep. it's a lot because I'm doing so much. And so- Yeah, you're kind of like stuck in that first swallow where you're still like doing everything, but you're wearing all I, the hats. I said that because in juxtaposition, the media business, some of them, like seven of them were working part-time all the time. And mm-hmm. there's like 23 total- virtual assistants that are on my team that I've hired and been through. And it's literally a piece of cake compared to training guys out in the field because of the flexibility that we're talking about that 90% of the tasks that they're doing don't require a specific time and got to be there. And like it's the pressure is low and they have other clients too. So the pressure's off me. So if I don't need them for a couple of weeks for some reason, or I'm a little overwhelmed, I say, Hey, give me a couple of weeks. I'm like, okay. And they just go focus on something else. And then we come back. Much easier to scale. You're not, you're not on the hook signing your name, much easier to scale, so to speak. So I like Mm -hmm. that. And dude, learning a ton here about, so the cost of employees, we've talked about hiring and we talked about a lot there. Now we're at the point where you're scaling. And the scale, purgatories, the purgatories of, scaling. of scaling. So we've got the demand. We figured out the marketing. We got the demand coming. The demand came and then we started hiring these employees and, and it's super herky-jerky. You hire two employees and then this one quits and then you got to fire that one. Then you hire these three and then the demand keeps coming in and you're out doing sales calls. And so getting started is super painful. And like I said, with where you're at right now and in like stage wait, two. Wait a second. At that point, when you're hiring more and then to quit, the tendency is to go throw on the firefighter uniform and run in there and go fix it. But then you're stuck. Yeah, you're back in there. Then you're you back can't in put there. it back down. So at what point do you just tie your hands behind your back and say, I'm not doing it? I mean, it's, it's kind of different for everybody. The sooner we can do that, the better. But it stresses us the hell out because we're letting people down and we don't like to let people down because we exist for everybody else. Like we're a business owner, right? Everybody thinks we're rich and our lives are easy. And at the end of the day, like 
we just obsess about are we doing a good enough job for everybody else out there? All of our employees, all of our customers, our significant other, our family, right? So we have this totally herky jerk start. And the faster you can get through that, the better. But it's painful to sit in that spot because when you have one or two employees and one quits, you lose 50% of your workforce. If you have 10 employees and one quits, you probably already have like three on standby because you're using Blue Skies Recruiting maybe and you've got a hopper filled up of like good applicants and you've already talked to them and you know who you're going to hire next. We always like to say, always be recruiting. ABCs. Of always rec- be recruiting. The ABCs of recruiting. Always be recruiting. So, so you have a recruiting business. Does blueskies.com slash Kelfus work with that? Yourblueskies.com, yeah. Yourblueskies.com slash Kelfus. You had all that set up, you sucker. I'm you know, just playing with you, man. Surprise, surprise. So we start scaling the business. And this first inflection point, this first purgatory is like we start investing in employees. And usually we like do one and then we have us and a helper and then we start doing a second one. And then we maybe need somebody in the office. And what happens is now we have to start investing in infrastructure because we don't we maybe don't want them coming to our house every day. We have to start investing in new software because we need like something like company cam. And now like maybe we're using response a bit on our website. And so we start building out more of this infrastructure stuff so that it takes work off of our plate. The problem is the revenue isn't coming in as fast as the money's going out when we start building this infrastructure and we start renting a spot and then we got all these utilities and with employees comes more recruiting expenses and employee engagement. And then maybe we're traveling to like a huge convention type of thing to go learn some stuff to build skills or we join a coaching program and that costs some dough. So we build out all this infrastructure, but the problem is we're not out in the field making that wage anymore because now we had to hire a couple people. So they're out in the field making the wage. We're out selling and salespeople make a wage, but the person in the field, usually we pay like 20 to 25% of revenue, depending on what we're doing. The salesperson usually gets like 10% of revenue. So you just took a big pay cut. You need to go sell like three times more than what you were producing in the field to even pay yourself the same wage. And that's fine because that's what we would literally pay a salesperson if we hired them is about 10% for every piece of revenue that they bring in. This is generally how we pay employees, but we just took a pay cut and it's going to take us a while to sell three times as much as we were producing. That's what we need to sell to produce the same wage for ourselves if that's the role we put ourselves in. And that takes a minute. And so what first happens, we're doing revenue of around like 200,000 and most of it comes back to us. Like 120,000 can come back to us as profit in the business because we don't have all that infrastructure. We don't have to spend as much on marketing. We don't have to pay for a virtual assistant or an office person if we're just like holding steady there. But the minute we push past that and we need an office person, we need to rent a space and we have the utility expenses and then the repairs and maintenance because Jimmy is driving down the highway with the freaking doors open and banging this and bashing that. All of a sudden, we have all these costs that come in and we need to like 3x our revenue to just make the same amount of money. And so if we stay in this spot, we make less money staying right here. Usually what happens is for like 200,000 to 400,000, we don't make any more money. And right around like 250 to 300, we actually like lose money or barely break even. And as we hit 500,000, maybe a little bit more, what we usually see is that's enough work for like a full-time office person and a few people in the field. And all of a sudden our infrastructure costs are paid for because at 500,000, it's the same amount of infrastructure that we needed at 200 to 300. We just need the same amount of space. We need the same amount of software. We need the same amount of everything. The same amount of marketing because now we're getting some repeat client revenue coming in. So all of a sudden at like 500,000 bucks, we're making like 150,000 again. We're paying ourselves a wage and the business is profitable. So our CEO is making money and our owner is making money. Both of our personalities get to make money. And then we go, well, that sucked, but now I'm here. I have made it. And everybody wants to hit a million dollars, right? That's a magic number. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Just sounds good. It's like a nice round number. It's Mm -hmm. got an extra zero. So everybody that's at 500,000 is like, well, I'm here. All that I need to do is more of what I've been doing and I'll be at a million dollars in no time, right? Like mathematically, I know how to get to 500,000. So so therefore, all I need to do is just double this. And it seems so easy. And then the first thing that happens, it's not as detrimental. Like when we first start scaling, it's like money to no money. And that happens to everybody. And so if you're there, it's fine. It's just what's supposed to happen. Mathematically, that's exactly how it happens. But we hit 500,000, we think we've made it and we think that's never going to happen to us again. But when we go from 500 to 600 or something like a 600 to 700, somewhere in there, depending on our business, now our office person is maxed out. So we need another one. Now our location is maxed out. So we need to go rent a bigger facility. Now the marketing levers that we use to get us to 500,000, we've maxed those out. So we got to go find another marketing lever. Now we got to go do some awareness marketing or something, and that can get really expensive and not pay off at all. 
we might swing and miss. Two years ago, I spent $25,000 on a radio station. We got four customers. I spent $25,000 on four customers, Keith. (laughs) Whoops. And it was fine. It's part of the purgatory, part of the cost of scaling. That radio station didn't work. We'll try Ah. something different. So you're never out of that. What usually happens is you're doing good profit-wise around maybe at that $500,000 level, you're making like 15% to 20% net profit after you take a wage. And then you hit this next hump where you grow your revenue and you need this next bump of infrastructure. And now you need a manager for the people in the field because you don't have enough time to manage the people in the field because now you got like six of them out there. So one of them has to be a manager, but he's not producing all the time anymore because he's running around running the supplies around. And so now you're paying him and you're paying two people in the office and you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to sell and keep everybody full. And you go to 600 to 700,000 in revenue and your net income goes down to like 10% and you're like dropping half how much money you're making. And you had just thought you made it. And so then you hit like 800,000 and that infrastructure starts to pay for itself and you get back up towards that 15 to 20%. And I'll be dead honest, we were talking about vulnerability earlier. Here's me being vulnerable. We did 750,000 last year, or I guess two years ago now. And I think we made like 15% profit margin or something on that. And we were like, sweet, we're there. We're so close to a million, right? We're sniffing the million. We'll be at a million in no time. Like magic number, million dollars. We did 1.1 million this last year. We made less money on 1.1 million than we did on 750,000. We did a whole bunch more work, created a whole bunch more problems. We had a whole nother person in the office. We had 14 trucks driving around. We had 14 guys out in the field and we made less money this year. Purgatory, baby. And you do that. And now when we budget it, this year, we think we can do like 1.4 million-ish with the same exact amount of infrastructure. We don't need to rent a different place. We probably don't need more transits. We added three last year. I think Andy and I looked at it yesterday and we made one or two more this year, especially if a couple old ones die. But we can do 1.3 to 1.4 with the same team and we don't need more infrastructure. And now we have all these clients, thousand new clients from last year. We served a thousand new clients last year. Now we just got to send them a text message. We don't have to go spend 30% of our revenue. So all of a sudden we should be able to make like 200,000 instead of 100. So even when you think you're out of the woods, cycle never goes away. And it's this constant purgatory. And I thought I knew that. And then it still caught me by surprise this last year. So it's just part of the game that we play. And you're a triple finance major who's obsessed with all this stuff. And and I got blindsided. And doing it at a high level and getting coached by people that are higher level than you. You're fully in it and you know all your numbers and metrics and this is happening. So it's kind of like the business cycle. It kind of happens. You're smiling. You like it. It kind of happens. You like this. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's fun. And halfway through the year, we like saw it coming. We were like, oh man, I see the writing on the wall here. This is just what's going to happen. And we changed a few things that we were doing, but we're playing a long-term game, right? And we're playing this math game. Like we know it's a math game. We know what the investment's got to be. And so the return just didn't come this year. I mean, we made a little bit of money, but 2022 is going to be the year. And then what's going to happen is 2023, we're going to go based on what we did in 2022. And we're like, Let's take it up another level and add three more salespeople and maybe a second location, and then we'll go backwards again. But now we know that we'll go backwards again, so it won't be as much of a surprise. I like it. All right, so that's the purgatories of scaling, bro. We covered some ground here. We got a few bullet points left. Bro, so next, number nine would be commission pay versus hourly pay. When you scale, all of a sudden you got a whole lot of wages going out the door. And so now you get into like the nuances of the decisions that you have to have in place to scale most effectively. So because most of our expenses are labor, no matter what we're doing in this business, between the people in the field and the people in the office, the number one expense that we have as service business owners is generally going to be labor. Unless we're installing like an HVAC system or a garage door and we're like installing something that stays on site, then like that cost is usually the highest thing and we're kind of upcharging it to the client. But the biggest cost that we have that isn't something that gets installed is the labor to do the work. So how we pay them starts to have a huge impact on our business. And the reason I like to talk about this commission versus hourly pay is it single-handedly can drive the production rates in our business. And it can be the biggest influence on the incentives that our employees have to behave a certain way. A lot of it comes back to our culture and what we're trying to incentivize and motivate our employees to do. One thing I have found into how to pay employees is generally commission-based pay is going to incentivize way higher production rates. Your team is just going to be so much more productive because they're motivated to be. They get paid to be. 
you're going to get way higher production rates and you're going to have to babysit quality a little bit harder because they're motivated to get the work done and that's their number one priority. If their character is a little more questionable, they might skip stuff. They might skip windows. They might skip a part of the lawn. They might do something disadvantageous because they're thinking short term. I've seen it happen. So you have to babysit quality a little bit more. They might not be malicious, but if they're rushing, they still might have lower quality because they're trying to be super productive. And they know that if they do this $800 a day of window cleaning and get done at two o'clock, they get paid the same amount as if they get done at five o'clock. So why not? Let's bust this thing out and get done at two o'clock, right? Why work an extra three hours to make exactly the same amount of money? So that incentivizes them to work fast. Now, the beauty of that is you could add another job on their schedule. They're working until five o'clock and they'll do a thousand dollar day instead of an $800 day, which means they make that much more money. So you're managing quality for the sake of production. When you pay hourly, you get the exact opposite. The quality usually happens because people generally like to do a good job. It doesn't always happen, right? Even if you're paying hourly, you're still going to have guys do a bad job, but you don't need to manage it as tightly. It'll be very apparent if they're doing a bad job, but you will have to manage production rate that much higher because the employee is incentivized to slow down because they make more money if they work longer. They don't make more money if they work harder. They don't make more money if they get stuff done. They make more money if it takes them longer. Now, you can always add like bonus plans and incentive plans to try to incentivize production, but essentially that's what commission is. When you pay commission, it's no different than hourly plus a bonus. That's really what it is. The reason we call it commission is there's a nuanced labor law rule that says if somebody's commission based, and there's a few sub rules there that I won't get into, but you can look it up, is you don't have to pay them overtime versus if they're hourly, you have to pay them overtime. So that's like one stipulation. And like I said, there's some rules to it that it's got to be, their commission has to be more than like minimum wage plus overtime, which in our industry, it pretty much always will be because they'll be able to be so productive. The other nuance of commission-based pay is that even if you pay commission, I should clarify when I say commission, I mean like a percent of revenue, right? So we generally believe that 25% for a window cleaner is good if they're rolling solo or 25% for the truck and 20% for pressure washing is good. Lawn care can be a little bit tricky. So I'll, I'll come back to that. But if you're paying commission, you still have to calculate hours. You still have to know if they made overtime or not to like satisfy that requirement. So you're still calculating hours anyway from a mathematical standpoint. You're just calculating what would hourly wage be at minimum wage versus what they made commission and you kind of pay the higher of the two. In our business, we set our own minimum wage at 16 bucks an hour for window cleaning. And then we use 25% commission for window cleaning or 20% for pressure washing. And so we just do the math every single week. We have a ton of guys making well over $1,000 paychecks right now when they get commission-based pay, whereas if they got 16 bucks an hour, they'd be making like 600 bucks. So they're almost doubling that. They're making like 30 bucks an hour damn near when they make commission-based pay from an equivalent standpoint. And they might knock out a $1,000 paycheck week and work 30 hours that week. But the beauty of it is, and the reason I tend to like commission-based pay is they win when we win and we win when they win. So if you're paying hourly and somebody gets a massive paycheck as a business owner, you kind of go like, oh shit. Like that's draining my bank account. And unless they did something profound that week, you almost view it as a negative. Like, shit, I got to pay that guy a whole lot of money. He worked like 60 hours this week and I'm losing my ass. We maybe didn't even get this project done, but I got to pay him all this anyway. And the employee's winning. And so it creates this like conflict where the employee's happy with this big paycheck and working all these hours. And the business owner's like, oh no, I got to pay this guy a whole bunch of money. And maybe this project's not done yet, or we didn't have a huge week, but the money's still going out my door and it's not coming back in. So you create this conflict and you're taking a lot of risk because you can't pass that cost on to the customer. You can't be like, hey, customer, Joey worked overtime this week and he wasn't very productive. So I told you that job was going to be 300 bucks, but actually it's got to be 500. Can't do that, right? On commission, we win when the employee wins and they win when we win. So if they go make a thousand, fifteen hundred dollar paycheck for a week, I'm like the first one to high five them. If they made that much money, that just means they made the business a whole shitload of money. And if they had a bad week, that means we had a bad week too. And then we get to work with them to help solve that. So we're always sitting on the same side of the table. Our incentive is the exact same, that we win together and we lose together. And I just prefer that relationship. I'm not a conflict-seeking guy, especially in the business where I don't want drama. Commission just creates us sitting on the same side of the table, problem solving the same things. Where it gets trickier, and why I said landscaping can be a little bit trickier is when you're working on projects and you have multiple people there, 
that math starts to get a little bit trickier because you might have a project that carries over like pay periods and you got to start doing a lot of tricky math. I find hourly plus bonuses can work better for that sort of thing. It can still replicate a similar model, but maybe you wait to pay the commission or the bonus until the project gets done and you set the project's got to be done in this many man hours to get the bonus. And so you can base it off the same type of percentage rules, but you can't just calculate a straight commission because you might have a project that takes three weeks if it's a really big project or something like that. So hourly plus a bonus structure that tries to like get to a commission percentage like that starts to make more sense. I've been hearing about commission, 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 pay for performance and all that stuff and Mm -hmm. people talking about it, about it, about it, about it. How do you actually calculate the pay that you pay them? Is it hourly plus commission or is there a base pay? And then if they make more than the base pay, they outperform it, you pay them that difference. What's the mathematical formula? Stick around as Keith returns with more of the Untrapped podcast in just a moment. Have you been thinking that it's time to really market your business in a more effective manner? Keith has spent years testing tens of thousands of dollars on marketing and advertising, and he is just amazed that the seven most powerful marketing strategies that he's ever found are surprisingly low cost and some are even free. He distilled down everything that he's learned into a seven-step guide and wants to give it to you for free. If you'd like to download the free guide, it's called Seven Steps to Marketing Your Business, then simply go to keithkalfas.com slash the number seven, the word steps. That's keithkalfas.com slash seven steps. And of course, the link will be in the show description. The Untrapped Podcast continues. It's an either or. It's a higher of the two. It's $16 an hour times however much they work, how many hours they work, and the overtime. Or, so you total that up for the week. Let's say that's 700 bucks. Or this guy produced $4,000 of revenue this week times 25% commission equals 1000 bucks. So wait, wait, say that again? So window cleaner goes out and he did $4,000 of revenue this week. So he averaged 800 bucks a day. He did 4,000 for the week times we pay him 25% commission on that 4,000 bucks, which is $1,000. So his gross pay is $1,000. And we just have a spreadsheet where we say, which one's higher? What if you got two guys or three guys or four guys or five guys? Then Do you, you take sp- that 25% and you keep splitting it down. What is the split between the guys? I don't split the percentage. I split the revenue. So every job that two guys are at, let's say two guys are at a $1,000 job. Each guy gets 25% of 500 bucks. The math works the same. You could pay 12.5% of 1000 bucks or 25% of $500. I think mathematically, it's easier to split the revenue of the job in two because then it's bigger numbers and you're working with bigger numbers instead of fractions of, of a percentage. And the percentage is almost a good way to look at it is the percentages per truck. If you got two guys in a truck, the truck pays 25% commission. You could split that up however you want between the guys, but that truck's going to go out and do 2000 bucks, and it can pay 25%. So wait, wait, if they go out and do 1000 in revenue in a day... It's 25% commission? Yep. The business can pay 25% of any dollar of revenue earned. So the business can afford to pay $250 of wages on $1,000 of revenue. And if there's two guys that do 1000 in revenue, they have to split 250 Yep. But if you send two guys out, they wouldn't just do 1000 They would do 2000 Now, I'll get to like, should you have two trucks and one guy taking a truck separately or should you have two guys in the truck? Because so- that's the other part of that decision. Mm, I don't want to get into my self-limiting beliefs here, but based off of the haptic feedback that I get in my marketplace when we're selling, and now landscaping, you can do it, but when it comes to window cleaning, I do some pressure washing, but let's just say for that, when I raise the prices that high, my closing rate goes down so low Mm -hmm. that I'm spending what I value my time at my service business. You're looking at the wrong side of it though. It's It's not about the price. It's about the production. When you pay commission, Mm -hmm. no price change at all. This is like the math from, we have three or four businesses we've helped go to commission style pay. Mm -hmm. When we've seen them go to commission style pay, their production rate generally goes up by 50%. They don't change their prices, but if you start paying a guy and he gets a cut of the work that he does versus he gets paid, this goes back to like the incentive piece of it. 
versus he gets paid the same amount no matter how fast he does it. He gets that job done. Even if he's a hardworking guy, it's amazing how much time must get wasted in a day because generally production rates go up by 30 to 50%. Okay, so if you're doing window cleaning jobs and I don't know, let's say they average 350 bucks a piece. Let's just for sake of easiness, 300 a piece, right? Which is kind of low. So they would go out and do three jobs in a day at 900 and then that's all. But under commission, I already know that they could do four. Mm -hmm. They would find a way to get it done. Yeah, and because they would be incentivized to do the fourth job versus they'd look at their schedule and yeah. say, like, just got three today, like getting these knocked out and I'll take all day to do them. But if they knew that they did that next job and they'd make another hundred bucks, all of a sudden, like, let me squeeze in that fourth job. I would prefer to make another hundred dollars today, makes, right? turns them into their own, the CEO of their own little self-employed services. They just happen to work for you. Yep. Yep. And it's amazing. If you just watch what they do by the truck, it tells mm -hmm. you everything. The minute we started switching to commission and Andy, who I merged with in, in my market, we helped him go from hourly to commission. And he went from two man to one man cruise. And I'll talk about that in a sec too. But the minute we switched him to commission, you see like the guy running back to the truck or like trotting uphill or just at the truck. He's thinking more about how he organizes his stuff so he doesn't have to make more trips to the truck, even in between jobs, right? Like, am I going to stop at the gas station and take a smoke break and then go here and go there? Their incentive to be expedient in between jobs goes up. Now, again, you have to be careful that they're not like speeding. We had one guy, Renee, that would like, we got multiple calls about the way he drove. I don't know if he would have driven any different. Was he not on commission? But you risk rushing. So you do need to preach safety a little bit more and just make sure that the quality and the safety is still up there. But you will find mathematically that production, when they get the upside of their hard work instead of you getting the upside of their hard work, even the best guys, their production usually goes up 30 to 50%. And like I said, we've done that with multiple businesses where we've helped them switch and immediately it pays for itself. Now it works with smaller crews better. And so the next point is smaller crews make you more money. I'm not saying you should always do smaller crews. There's a whole lot of trade-offs between two-man, three-man, four-man crews or one-man crews in window cleaning and home cleaning and stuff with smaller average tickets that can get done within a day or a half a day. One-man crews wins over and over and over again. And now the argument against it is usually safety. Like, oh, if I send one person out, who's holding the ladder and who's doing this and who's doing that and how are they going to be safe? Our math and our company shows very clearly that two people have way more accidents than one person because one person watches out for their back. It's you. You're not going to take stupid chances. I mean, some guys might, but two people, it requires them to communicate really well. Communication is not easy. seems like it should be easy. We were laughing about that before. Communication can be very tricky. And the assumptions that we make, we've had a lot of accidents when we've had two people out about like assumptions that the ladder was set up correctly when somebody just leaned it up and the next person starts going up and bloop, scary as hell. But we've had multiple times where I've seen that happen or somebody spraying water here and doesn't know that this other person is over there, right? You really got to be on the same page and be dialed in about who's where. And when you're working with somebody else, you just tend to make assumptions about what they're up to and where they are and how they're doing their job because 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what they're up to. But that 1% of the time that they're not, somebody could get hurt. So safety is usually the thing that people rationalize to say like two-person teams. I think that's definitely the case sometimes. Like there's some jobs you look at and you're just like, you need two people at that job, whether it's like the roof pitch or the pitch of the land where like the ladder is and somebody's just got to be there holding it or the ladder's going to slip away. <sighs> got jobs like that, Bring right? back memories, bro. So there's definitely jobs where it's two people are safer. There's no doubt about it. The nice thing is if you run solo crews, it's really yeah. easy to send two solo crews to the same house and then have them split up. That's what we do in the maid service business. If a house is going to take more than four hours for somebody to clean, then it's just like, it's overwhelming. You're just in the same house for too long. Those houses and the customer doesn't like it because you're just there all damn day. Any job that's like more than half the day, then we'll send two people to. And then their next house, they'll split back up as to like one person crews going their separate mm -hmm. ways. Commission works so good when it's solo because they get all the benefit of their hard work. There's no like, well, I'm the one working hard. And so maybe I'm going to slow down because Ralph here isn't working so hard, right? And why would I work twice as hard to make the same amount of money? The inverse doesn't happen. The slow guy doesn't speed up to the fast guy's pace. The fast guy always slows down to the slow guy's pace. So commission works so good. Andy, my business partner, before we merged, I want to say like his average day for a window cleaner was around like $400. So like a team of two would do 
seven to 800 bucks of window cleaning. And we were talking to him. We're like, man, our best guy goes out and does a thousand bucks by himself. Like, and he's back by two o'clock and Andy didn't believe it. Right. He's just like, there's no way like these guys, like he must be cutting corners. He must be doing a bad job. And it's like, no, everybody requests him. And we tell him he stands there too long talking to all the old ladies that hire him. They love him. And it's purely because he's working for himself, right? He gets all the upside of his production. He doesn't need to try to communicate with somebody else about, hey, did you get that window? Hey, did you start over here? Hey, I got to take this phone call. Can you keep going? And I'm going to like quick do this. And then you can take a phone call after that. There's no like standing around waiting for the other guy to do something because you're the only guy. So if you're solo, you go faster because ain't nobody else going to get that house done. That house is not going to get done until you get it done. And because you'd be commission pay, you're going to get it done so much faster because why make it take longer than it has to? Because you're going to make the same amount of money today, no matter what you do. And you might make more actually, if you get it done and you have time to take one more job. So I'm not saying it's the right solution for everybody, but our math shows very clearly that commission-based pay leads to higher production rates, leads to more revenue, which allows you to do more cool stuff in your business and grow faster. Again, works better with smaller crews. So the second piece of that math is small crews pretty much always make more money unless you're doing big projects. If you're doing big multi-day projects, those rules kind of go out the door. When you're doing jobs that where you do a couple in a day, especially if you're doing like three or four in a day, if you have two people in that vehicle, the amount of time that they spend in the car goes up astronomically. We made this mistake in our maid service business. I'll really quick just walk through the logic of it. And I'm like embarrassed that it took us like three years to realize this. We were wondering like, why? I mean, our teams are just not that efficient. Our production rate just always seems so slow. We would send a team out to go clean four houses. If you have two people in that car, so we're comparing a team of two, go clean four houses or two individuals that would just go clean two houses each, right? Either way, four houses are getting cleaned. You're either just sending two people out to go clean them all together or individuals go clean two houses each. If you send them out as a team, you start at the office, you get drive to the first house is two drives because you got two people in the car. Second house is two more drives, so you got four. Third house, you're at six drives. Fourth house, you're at eight drives, and you're back to the office. So you have 10 drives. Compare 10 drives to if there's two different individuals and they just have to go do their two houses. They're at the office. They go to their first houses, so two drives. They go to their second houses, four drives, back to the office, six drives. You're cleaning four houses, but if you send them out in a team of two, you got 10 drives. If you send them out individually, you only have six. So you're literally spending twice as much time in the car damn near if you send out a team versus if you send them out as individuals. And after we realized that math, it was like, holy shit, we're paying for them just to ride around in a car all day. And that's why they can't produce. You can't clean shit when you're driving around in a car. And plus, when they have that many drives, they're stopping at a gas station and taking a smoke break and going here and buying a soda. Less drives just means more, you know, less opportunities for distractions. And so when we switched to solos, they would also end up just doing a third house because they saved all that time and they got paid commission. So they wanted to go get more money because they otherwise they're done at like one o'clock. They wouldn't even be working a full day. They'd have two houses done by like one, two o'clock, throw a third house on my schedule. I'm here till five anyway. I might as well go make another 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And all of a sudden, not only did our production rate climb, but just our total revenue did because we had more capacity. Capacity equals demand. So then we just had to go get more demand and sell some more stuff. The math works out. I love everything you're saying, bro. As our boy Latimer says, the math is the path. The math is the path. That drive math tripped me up, dude. When we figured that out, A, like we felt really stupid. And then we also felt really smart at the same time. Like, oh, I'm really glad we figured that out. I wonder how many people have already figured that out type of thing. I was like, oh, shit, we've been spending. I, like, I never did go back and calculate how much money we spent because we had 30 cleaners at one point in that business. That was a lot of drives, sending 15 cars out with two people in them. That was an embarrassing amount of drives that we didn't have to take. I bet it was hundreds of thousands of dollars we spent on wages just driving people around. I like it. I don't like it. That was a lot of money. I'm glad we switched. <laughs> so is that smaller crews versus bigger crews too? Or yeah. is that next? I think that's it. I think we covered that one. I transitioned without even telling you. Because <laughs> the they go one. together, bro. They do. And like commission pay works best with smaller crews. It just works the best. Once you get into like high rise window cleaning, big landscaping projects where jobs take multi-days, you need bigger crews there or like you're pressure washing a huge apartment type of complex or something like that. And it's a multi-day job. 
you're just going to need bigger crews there and that's fine. And, and then commission starts to break down and it doesn't work as well and that's fine. But then paying hourly with bonuses tied to production rate and how fast you get that done, you can replicate commission still. You can still set the same incentive if they don't get it done that fast and to the quality rate that you require, then they don't get the bonus. And it's basically the same as commission with an hourly floor. So you can kind of replicate the same thing. You just have to do it in reverse a little bit for project type stuff. Dude, that's sweet. Also, to remind you, go on Facebook and check out Dan's uh, podcast and show Bookkeeping, Beer, and BS. Mm -hmm. It's heavy on the beer and the BS, but every once in a while we do some nerdy bookkeeping stuff too. I like it. Andy and I got to do our annual P&L review. Andy, who runs our Minneapolis business, every once in a while, he and I get on there and show our stuff. I mean, we do the same thing. Andy and I look at the same report that I send you. Well, I don't send it to you monthly, but that we send you monthly. And we'll get on our Facebook page and go through ours and be vulnerable. We should actually, it, that'd be kind of fun to show from two years ago when we did like 750000 and made the same amount of money that we did when we did 1.1. I think people would like to see that. Dude, that's gold right there. Because well, you're talking us. about navigating through those steps and it's real, your man. experience. It's real. I appreciate it, man. So the next one is 11 Buying assets the right way. Because when you scale, you got to buy a lot of toys. We got that. And then we have buying stuff to save on taxes. And they kind of go together. Because we hear all the time that we're supposed to spend a bunch of money at the end of the year. So the IRS doesn't get it all. You know, that's what we hear. So buying assets the right way, though. As we scale, we need a lot of equipment. We need a lot of vehicles because we got a lot of people going out to do work. And they can't just like beat me up, Scotty type of thing. So... What we find is, I mean, we already talked about cash flow, cash is king. And if we're out there just buying all these assets up and paying cash for them, we won't have the money to spend on the marketing or the recruiting to grow the business. And I see a huge mistake made by a lot of guys that are just starting out or just scaling their business that the first thing they do is go get the biggest rig they can. They go get a big badass truck, which is mostly about their ego. And like, I've got an F-150, like I love my freaking truck. Once you have a truck, you never not have a truck, right? You're just never going back. But they spend all of their money on that truck or on that pressure washing trailer or on that landscaping trailer. And those things don't make money. They're no good. They enable you to make money, but they don't make money. The people make the money. The customers make the money and the employees make the money. That's where the money is, which is why I hit on that first. Like you need those two things. The equipment is useless until you have a great employee and until you have a customer to send them to. Once you do, then you need the equipment. If you buy the equipment first, you're going backwards. If you go set up all this super expensive equipment and you don't save any money to spend a bunch on recruiting and make sure you go find a good person and to spend a bunch on marketing and make sure you have a bunch of work to go do, you just got a bunch of assets sitting there that took all your cash and they don't produce anything because you got no work on the schedule and you got nobody to go do the work. And eventually, usually when we buy those assets early on, we buy them for us. And that's the lens we have is like, I want to get a sweet truck because I deserve it because I'm a business owner and it's a tax write-off. Whereas if I just bought it, just me, it wouldn't be a tax write-off because I'm a business owner. I get the sweet tax write-off. So let me like go get that badass F-250, right? But the next person we hire is going to be a 19-year-old kid that drives around with the door open and can't be trusted behind the wheel. And that's who we're buying the vehicle for. We're not buying it for us. If we're scaling a business, none of those assets are ours. They're all for 19-year-old kids. And that's the lens we got to have. So like buying the souped up, sweet-ass truck is neat. And the business will allow us to do that for like our personal vehicle. And that's fine and dandy, but that thing's not going to make any more money than the beater that we have. They both make the exact same amount of money. Bro. And when you're putting a 19 year old kid behind it, I don't want him behind a $50,000 truck. Uh huh. Cause, Cause they're just going to crash the damn thing. Right. And they don't know how to back up a trailer. How would they? Unless they grew up in like Michigan or Wisconsin and they're a fisherman, then they would know how to back in a trailer. Cause they've been backing in their dad's boat since they were like 12. But chances are, they're going to mess your stuff up. So buying a bunch of expensive assets as you scale doesn't really make a lot of sense anyway, because the person that you're putting behind it or the person that's using it isn't you. And it's not somebody that you know. Now, it is super important that the equipment is reliable, trustworthy, and productive. Like I'm not saying don't buy good, useful stuff. Just don't get sucked into bells and whistles and buying things that are ego, buy things that are investments that are valuable. But buy them after you have the customers and the employees. So first, go fill up your schedule six weeks. Don't buy a truck. Go fill up your schedule six weeks. Because then the truck's already paid for. You got customers for the next six weeks that already bought you this truck and already bought you that equipment. They don't know that when you went and sold them, you didn't even have the stuff to go do the job yet. They don't know that. You showed up. You sold them a thing. 
You can go buy the equipment later. Likewise, go get the employee first and get them trained up because otherwise this equipment has only got you to run it. And then you can't go sell and keep scaling your business. So first thing is wait to buy your assets until you actually have some work to do and somebody to go do the work. Don't go buy a bunch of flashy new assets and spend all your cash flow on that and then not have any money left over to do marketing and do recruiting with because it's the marketing and the recruiting that actually makes you money. The assets are just the tool to get those two people connected and those two people are the ones that make you the money as the business owner. The second thing is there's this weird element of pride in saying like, I bought that thing cash and I didn't have to borrow money for it. The problem is if you spend all your money on the asset, back to the same problem, you don't have any money left for the marketing and the recruiting. So while you may have not had to take out a loan on this sweet truck that you bought, and we don't like debt because Dave Ramsey told us that debt's bad, you can't grow your business. You got nothing left to grow the business. You just got this sweet truck. So by financing it, let's say we buy a $30,000 truck. Let's put $10,000 down instead of paying 30,000 bucks for it. Now we have $20,000 to spend on marketing and recruiting. That's easily going to fill up our schedule for six weeks. And now that truck, let's say we got a payment of like 400 or 500 bucks. That string of clients is going to pay that truck payment over and over and over and over and over again. And that truck interest rate is going to be like 5%. We talked about it earlier, like this ROI decision and even like, you know, how to set up our finances. I said right at the beginning, the proper financial setup is don't be afraid of debt. It's okay to go borrow money at 5% to go make 20%. So go finance that truck at 5% and go make 20% because that's what our business can return. So don't pay cash for that thing. You're giving away a 15% net return. You can go borrow money at 5% and put it into the business at 20% and make the difference. Anytime you pay for something in cash that you can finance at a better interest rate than the return of your business is money you're throwing away. Now, the flip side of that is We don't want to get upside down on that asset. We don't want to finance the whole thing 100%. If it's a $30,000 truck and we finance 100% of it, the minute we own that truck, it's not worth $30,000 anymore, right? And if anything happens to it, we're underwater. We're upside down. There's no worse position to be in than when you owe more money on something than that thing is worth because you have no options. You can't sell it unless you pay a shitload of money. And because if you had to make that decision, you probably didn't have any money, you're kind of effed. So our rule in our business is we always put around 30% down, another 30%er. Maybe I just like that number. I don't know. We always put around 30% down because it just tends to be that no matter what happens to that vehicle or the vehicle market in general, we're never going to be upside down on that vehicle. We're never going to be backwards where we're going to be put in a spot where we can't pay for it and we can't use it. And that's such an uncomfortable feeling. We're out of control when that happens. We have no control over the situation and we're just paying and we don't get any utility out of the thing. At least if we put 30% down, we never have to worry about being, never is probably not the right word. There's a very, very slim chance that we ever have to worry about being upside down on that and have the stress of it. And we're capturing 60, 70% of it that's financed. We're saving all that cash flow. We're dumping it into marketing and recruiting. And then that goes and makes us the return on our investment. That's where we make the money. So our rule is put 30% down, but don't pay for it in cash. Finance around 70% so that we're saving all that cash flow and reinvesting it in things that earn us a return on our investment, the marketing and the recruiting. The other thing I would add to that is don't buy new, buy something used, gently used maybe, but it just tends to be that if we buy something new, A, like I said, we're buying it for a 19 year old, but B, the thing is going to lose value so fast that buying it new is just paying a sticker premium. Now, It does depend on what the vehicle market is. Like, I'm not into buying new vehicles, but like I told you when we were driving here, we just ordered a new SUV because buying a used one was actually more expensive. And so there's going to be weird vehicle markets where buying used might not make sense. But normally, it's just not worth paying that like premium for a new vehicle because it's not yours. It's the businesses. You're the investor. You're the owner. You're putting a 19 year old kid behind that vehicle. It's just not worth it. Get them to crank windows. You know, you get those and you get the manual locks. Uh, That's fine. That's all they need. It's a work uh, truck. It needs to look nice. Throw some logos on there. That's fine. But it doesn't need to have like the big moonroof, right? It doesn't need to have it. It just needs to go crank money out. And the moonroof doesn't make any more money than whatever other roof you got on there. So it's an asset. You got to buy it the right way, which gets me to number 12, final, final. Everybody believes that we ought to be spending a bunch of money at the end of the year because damned if we're going to be paying the IRS money, right? Have you ever bought anything at the end of the year to not pay the IRS? Last year was the most amount of money I ever made. 
and I did have a decision. I was like, I'm either going to give this to Uncle Sam. I think we. I think I'm you might have messaged me even. I think we maybe I had did. a convo about it. And I bought something. And even though I was able to write it off my taxes, I really use it in my business. Now I'm stuck paying that damn thing off. But good thing it wasn't too much money. They're like, what was it? Piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I tested that out. And now I know what that feels like at a small level. So here's the funny thing. The savings, I'm all about it. When we can minimize our taxes legally, that makes a shit ton of sense. Why not invest in growing our business? Because the minute we have to pay taxes, that's money that we don't get to invest in the growth of our business. So we might as well spend the money on the growth of the business than pay it to the government. That logic makes sense over and over and over again. The government will make more money too if we grow the business because then they're going to have more taxes that they can get from us for that business. So like we all win. Now, the problem lies in A, did we actually buy something that grew the business or did we just have another excuse to go buy a sweet ass truck, which I see that a lot, right? Like, well, I better spend this money and it's a tax write off. So let me go get this Raptor. That happens. That's not the worst thing in the world, but we're kind of like fooling ourselves when we do that sort of thing. The other piece of it is if we, I'm going to stay on that for a second. If the true point of that is to invest in our business and grow our business and not have to pay it in taxes, we shouldn't buy an asset. We should spend on marketing or recruiting because those are the two things, to my last point, those are the two things that make us the money. The assets don't make us the money. It's the people that make us the money. So investing more in marketing and recruiting will have a higher payoff than investing in the asset. Now, buying the equipment makes a lot of sense. If you're going to buy it in January or February or March, you might as well buy it in December and get the tax benefit now. But mathematically, if you think about what's actually happening here, yeah, we can say, let's say we bought a $10,000 piece of equipment and our tax rate is 30% between federal and state, just to make up a number. So we buy that $10,000 piece of equipment, we're saving $3,000 in taxes. But what's actually happening is we're just moving that $3,000 savings a year forward. If we're going to buy it in March anyway, we were going to save the same $3,000 the next year, right? Mm Mm-hmm. If we're buying the equipment either way, we're saving $3,000 this year or we're saving $3,000 next year. The value of saving $3,000 this year is that we can take that $3,000 and reinvest it in the business. It's $3,000 that we have to reinvest. Well, we're saying our business generates around a 20% return, so that's $600 of value. So we spent $10,000, but we really only got $600 of value because we would have made the $3,000 savings next year either way. So, and that's assuming that we get to expense all 10,000 of it, right? Today with 179 deductions, we get to expense all 10,000 of that asset that we bought. Before the 179 deduction existed, that $10,000 asset would have been depreciated over five years. So we would have got to expense 2,000 of it this year, 2,000 of it the next year, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 over five years. It works a little differently than that, but just like roughly. So if if that was the case, which some point we'll probably be back in that structure. And if that's the case, and you're really only saving $2,000 because that's all you get to expense. And now 30% of $2,000, like the actual taxes of those, that would be 600. And then your 20% return on $600 is like 120. Now you bought a $10,000 asset to save 120 bucks. So like the math of buying stuff at the end of the year, isn't nearly as valuable as it feels like it is. Like it feels like we're spending 10,000 bucks and so we're saving all this money on taxes. But if we were going to buy it the next year anyway, and if this 179 deduction didn't exist, it's like 1% that we actually are better off. So it's not this huge, massive like savings that it feels like it should be. But where it does make sense is buying marketing or recruiting because that's the best investment we can make in our business. That's what grows it the fastest and grows it the most. Capacity and demand going up at the same rate or buying that equipment that we need like early on the next year, but not like fooling ourselves into justifying that we need it, but actually buying something that's going to like make us money the next year. So it can be valuable, but we shouldn't do it under the pretense of I'm going to do this to avoid paying taxes. It should be done under the pretense of, I'm going to do this because I believe this is a great investment for my business and I might as well do it in December instead of in March because why the hell not? Like If I'm going to do it either way, it's more valuable to do it in December than in March, assuming it doesn't create a cash flow issue for me, but it doesn't create a huge tax savings. And I think we get sucked into thinking we're having this huge tax savings impact and it's just not that not quite so big as we think it is. Mm, I like that. So buying stuff to save on taxes just for the reason that you think you're saving on taxes. Yeah. Does Ashley like to buy shoes? Is she a shopper? She said she was maybe going shopping. (sighs) 
There was this funny thing on TikTok her sister sent. She was laughing in tears. I go, what's that? Her sister sent. And it was like these guys from a different country with things on their heads. And they were doing like this dance out in like the sand or whatever. And there was the song playing, here come the hot stepper, word her up, I'm the lyrical gangster. <laughs> and they were dancing like this. And, and then the, the, the meme was, this is me on my way to Target spending all my husband's money. <laughs> Anyways, if you saw it, she thought it was so funny. I'm just playing around, bro. She has her own money. She, but we're, I'm not trying to say if she's shop. She's not. She's actually very thrifty and very smart at shopping. She's proud when she saves money on stuff. But, that's where I was going with this. Yeah. Have you ever heard like? But look how much money I saved. Uh, has, has, have you ever heard that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same like thing we're convincing ourselves. I like to say, well, Marty's not a shopper either. So like when I give her a hard time, it's as a joke because she's like super cheap. But I was like to say, you're just going broke saving money. Like you're justifying spending more money by saving it, but you're still $50 less rich or $100 less rich. Like I don't care that you save 200 bucks. You're still out $100. Like the fact of the matter is the money still went out the door. That wouldn't have gone out the door if you didn't buy the thing. Now you got to buy things. And if you need to buy the thing anyway... You might as well do it as tax effectively or as, as cost effectively uh, as possible. Just be very conscious and don't let your ego get in the way and all that stuff. Yeah, don't fool yourself. I love it. So one thing for, man, I was, even when I got my first new truck, I was nervous because I always had the biggest piece of crap on the road and I felt like I didn't deserve it. But one thing that I was thinking about the ego is if you grew up really, really poor and you've always worked dead on jobs, you never had any money. When you finally get some money, you want to feel what it feels like to buy the thing and actually own it. And then the actual feeling of going through that process and owning a nice truck or something might make you feel like, yes, and have confidence to go out and make more money. So there's this weird intangible, but I think it can get totally out of hand, like mm -hmm. you're saying, because some people might be growing an entire business and they want to grow a million dollar business because they just want their dad to be proud of them, or mm -hmm. they just want to look cool, or they finally want to feel significant. And it isn't even for the real reasons that if you ask them, think about stuff like that. That's funny. Actually, as you say that, I realize I could probably justify that we should pay me more in our business. And we were talking about that earlier. And I intentionally don't take more because the reason I run our business has nothing to do with me making money. Now, that helps that my wife has a really good job and makes like twice as much money as I do. So I don't need to make a lot of money in it. But I actually do it to make people proud. That's totally it. Like, it's not about the money. I want to make my wife proud, my kids proud, my parents proud that I'm like taking risks and doing hard things. So in a funny way, we were talking about this earlier too, is I do it for me, right? Like I want to make them proud. That's all for me. I get the benefit of feeling like I made them proud. If I make a bunch of money, that's neat, but only if it's connected to making them proud. If I won the lottery and this is like happens, right? People win the lottery and they're freaking miserable because there's no pride in the money. Whereas when we like grow a business and do really hard things... We connect the pain and suffering with pride, and then we get a result. And I think, you know, you can say, what's wrong with kids today? And I've gone on this rant before, but business owners have this unique lens that so many people are unfortunate to not have, which is, and I don't know that we all realize it, but we get into this business because of the pride that we get out of doing really hard stuff. You would never be an entrepreneur if you didn't like enjoy some of that pain and suffering. And we've just all had enough little snips of success that we get that pride out of it, and that's what fuels us. That pride is the thing that keeps us going and that keeps us wanting more. It's not the money. Bro. It's the pride, dude. Amazing. It's all about the pride. I love it, bro. So that's all 12 steps. We hit 12. We hit the dozen. I don't even have a baker's dozen. I should have had a bonus baker's dozen, but I don't even have one. You got one? Whoa, that was a riddle to me. <laughs> I'm gonna put all the I'm gonna put all the links below to this other segments and shows we did. If you didn't have time to watch this whole thing, I'll put all the links below, and you can listen to the entire thing on the Untrapped podcast on Spotify, Apple, Keith Kelfus, Dan Plata. How can everybody find you, bro? Yourblueskies.com. Go check it out. Yourblueskies.com slash Kelfus if you want to get some deals on stuff. Hit up Bookkeeping Beer and BS on Facebook. Hit it up on YouTube for our, what we like to call, Bookkeeping Bites. You get the little hot tips. Where else can you find me? 